Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Board of Selectmen meeting for Monday, April 7th. It is 7.15 p.m. and I call the meeting to order. I just want to remind everyone that this meeting is being cablecast by ACMI and may be recorded by other people. Our first order of business is an organizational meeting. Um, Mrs. Krabelka. Okay, our first order of business tonight is to have an organizational meeting for the purpose of electing a chair and vice chair. And vice chair. At this point, I would like to ask the board for nominations. Mr. Grilly. Uh, I nominate that uh, we, Mr. Stephen Byrne for chairman. Second. I move to close the nominations. Do I hear any other nominations? Oh. A second. All right, second. Okay. All right, Diane, you can. So we vote on moving to close. All right, we're going to vote now to move to close nominations. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, now we're going to vote for chair. Mr. Grilly. Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Kiro? Yes. So hearing five to nothing, and I have the nominations are closed for the chairman's race. Now we need a nomination for vice chair. Mr. I Dunn. nominate Joe Kiro. Second. I move to close the nominations. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Kiro? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Grilly? Yes. So congratulations, nominations are closed, and we now have Mr. Byrne as our chair and Mr. Kiro as our vice chair. <laughs> Did you hear what she said, Kevin? No, she didn't mean us, Diane. <laughs> Trying to get that as closest to the exit. It doesn't matter which side. I don't know right <laughs> Finally, I don't have the table at my <laughs> chest. <laughs> Mr. Grid. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first thing, Mr. Chairman, I would like to welcome back our two colleagues who were reelected and um, look forward to continuing to serve with them, Mr. Dunn and Mrs. Mahan. Welcome back. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Grid. Uh, with your permission, so I'd also like to take a moment to congratulate Mr. Tosi, Ms. Dunn, and Mr. Buckley, um, who uh, fell just short of their elections, but it's, it's citizens like that who want to participate in this process uh, that really make a difference in this town. They all uh, served one heck of a race. Uh, I've heard a couple of comments since the election. One is that uh, all those incumbents who ran were reelected. And then the next person says, just barely. So how do we, um, how do we take that message? But uh, you know, uh, Ms. Lucarelli was returned as clerk. Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor was returned to the Board of Assessors. Uh, Dan Brosnan was returned as a commissioner of the Housing Authority. Our two incumbents here, Mr. Gilligan was returned, and two incumbents on the school committee. Uh, and the third, um, uh, Ms. Seuss was elected to the school committee because uh, Leva Hyman decided not to run again. Uh, and she deserves a lot of credit for the service she provided to this town as well. So would like to see more than 6,100 people come out and vote, but that's who came out and voted. And so um, again, congratulations to all. And, and a lot of thanks to those who put, you know, losing isn't easy and they put a lot of time and effort into it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. Let's get started. Um, for approval, consent agenda, um, meetings of minutes for March 24th, 2014, March 28th, 2014. We have appointments of new election workers, Jeannie Kazaza, Lillian Christmas, James Foran, Rona Logue, Elsie Murphy, Beverly Smellars, Deborah Terzian, Deborah West, we have a request for a one-day all-alcohol license for 5314 for the annual fundraiser at Fidelity House. We have a request for a one-day beer and wine license for 42714 for the Japanese Sister City 30th anniversary celebration here at Robbins Memorial Town Hall Auditorium. We have a vote for the burial agent for the town of Arlington. A request 
for a permit for the Patriots Day Parade, which will be held on Monday, April 21st, 2014. I move approval subject to all conditions as set forth. Second. Do we have any discussion? Over. Yeah. One question. Um, Marie, on both of the one day alcohol licenses, sometimes we get approval from the police. And the Corey's been at his thing before it's given out. He'll, he'll so part of the conditions is his, conditions. his approval. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, is anyone in the audience here to speak on any of these items? No? So. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just I want to uh, take a moment to do a quick commercial for the request for one day uh, beer and wine license for the Japanese sister city. On Sunday night, um, April 27th, first of all, at 5 o'clock, there's going to be a dedication of a bench in memory of Dick Smith and the Arlington Nagoka Kyo uh, sister city 30 year relationship. That will happen at 5 o'clock out here on the side uh, garden. Uh, very close to the cherry tree that was planted, uh, the blossom, cherry blossom that was uh, planted by Mayor Oda when he was here last. At 6 p.m., there's going to be a dinner in the town hall. Uh, after that, the Japanese students are going to perform some dance and some singing uh, of their, um, uh, from their culture. And then uh, we're going to repeat uh, part of the town hall 100th show which was done uh, back in June of last year. Uh, that got a screaming standing ovation. Do you all remember that? It's, I do. Uh, but it's the uh, memories of the town with Richard Duffy and then the music uh, that we listened to for the last 100 years. And that will be Sunday night. If you're interested in tickets, they're $50 each, and uh, you can get those through the selectman's office. Anywhere else they can get them, Marie? Can we get them online through Patsy, I forget? Okay, just so through the selectman's office. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And we have a motion in a second. So all those in favor? Please Aye. 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 Opposed? Five nothing. Moving on, we have appointments. Our first is an appointment to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Jeanette Rebecca. Hey, come on, uh, if you come to the microphone, please. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for willing to serve. If you could just share a little bit about yourself, why you want to be on TAC. Um, well, I'm a transportation planner by trade, and I actually work in the neighboring community of Lexington, um, managing their Express bus and also staffing their transportation advisory committee. So I feel like I have a lot of valuable experiences to share and look forward to serving our town. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, volunteering. And I, when I read your resume this weekend, I was really excited about the Lexington connection because I think that really adds a lot. And I want to put one particular bug in your ear is that you are in a position to uh, uniquely to help us with regionalization mm -hmm. because you see the like you know details that no one else is doing about both towns. Mm -hmm. And so I would love it if you uh, thought creatively about ways that we can do more coordination with Lexington and other towns because you're going to see some things that I think that we've never thought of before. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And to, to that point, uh, am I gathering from where you were sitting that you do work with the 128 Business Council as well? So you, you yes, the town of Lexington is also a community I member know. and we work closely with them. Fantastic. Great. Thank you for your service. Yes, uh, Jeanette, thank you so much for your willingness to serve. Have you noticed already how much better the leadership is in Arlington than in Lexington? <laughs> <laughs> My no vote comment. depends on this answer. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Excellent qualifications. Great. Thanks. And, um, I think that you'll find everyone else on tech to be really great to work with. They're a very professional group, and I really admire the work they do. So um, we have a motion in a second. So, so all those in favor? Uh, Aye. All those opposed? Great. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Jeanette. Next, we have appointment Janine White from the Conservation Committee. Hi. Uh, Jean, could you share a little bit about yourself as well, why you want to be on ConCon? Sure. Um, I've been living in Arlington for a little over two years now. I just recently purchased a condo. Um, I work in South Boston at an engineering firm. I've been doing civil design for about 10 years now, focusing in stormwater and roadway and parking lot design. And I'm just, I'd like to use my expertise and give back to the community a little bit and get a little more involved. I move approval. Second. 
any further discussion? Thank you very much. I want to thank Ms. White, Janine, for uh, stepping forth, and you have a very, as the previous candidate, impressive resume, curriculum vitae. Really excited about your experience with MassDOT, um, mm -hmm. considering the projects we have coming forward, as well as um, the drainage experience that you have in terms of drainage reports and, and the like that you've contained in there, especially since we do have the ongoing issue of the CSO discharges that it still remain going yes. into the owl life, as well as there's still the floodplain mm -hmm. map that's under consideration. Yep. Um, and so I, I know you're going to bring a lot of expertise to that and, and, and complement sure. what's, what's there. But I'm really excited when I saw all that because I think you, you're really going to round the group out um, and make it an even more robust working group. So thank you so much for doing this. Sure. Thank you yep. very much. Thank you very much. And we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Um. <coughs> Next, we have an appointment to the Disability Commission, and that is Dr. Burton Push. 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 Um, unfortunately, Dr. Push isn't able to make it here tonight, but um, I, I'm really impressed with his resume, and I, I'm fine moving forward without his um, attendance, if everyone else is okay with that. Move approval, but it'd be nice to meet him at another meeting when he okay. could make it. Yeah. Second that. So we'll table it? No, 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 no. Move okay. approval, but okay. just okay. When ask him to introduce himself to us one night. Thank you. Um, I got to ask him what he thinks of the leadership of the town. State. That's completely understandable. I don't know why I wasn't He's consistent, that. guys. <laughs> um, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Next, we have Citizens Open Forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Do we have anyone here for a citizens open forum? No? Oh, moving. Uh, Mr. Chairman, B B Laurie, did you want to speak on the parade? And I Right, but <laughs> I didn't know if you were here in time to. I, I wasn't. I walked in late. So okay, sorry. But Good evening. How are Laurie you? Laurie Marshall. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm Laurie Marshall, the vice chair of the Arlington Patriots Day Parade Committee. I'm mm -hmm. sorry I missed the permit approval. Um, we have a lot going on this year. We have the Shriners coming back. We have nine, ten bands, a lot of community groups. We're really excited. and. We hope that all community groups and town officials will make it and join us at 9.30 on Monday, April 21st. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. For all the work. Anyone else? Okay, Citizens Open Forum is closed. Moving on, traffic rules and orders and other business. We have a request for one handicapped parking space in the Arlington Heights Business District. Rachel Bonapane from the I like the Commission on Disability. Yeah, uh, oh, Dan, Dan's hand was up, Dan. Um, I was, so based on the memos from Jack Jones and the Commission on Disability, um, I was gonna move approval. So just to, for, so I, and the reason I'm supporting is because uh, in, the, in the Heights, so uh, near the Park Avenue extension, we currently have a handicapped space in three locations on three of the, we'd call, would I call them quadrants, and I think it makes sense to describe those quadrants. And in particular, if there's no handicapped space in the quadrant that is Capri Pizza and Classic Cafe down by uh, D'Agostino's, and so there's a space out in front of Penzi's, so it's like farthest from, or not farthest, but farther from the corner, which makes it across the street from Cambridge Savings Bank and so on and so forth. So it made, it, I was, it made sense to me, so uh, based on that, Based on the recommendation from our committee and, uh, and our employees, I move approval. Second. Any further discussion? Joe? Yeah, I, I feel comfortable also because it looks like they did take pains to try to separate a little bit from that bus stop that knocked out some of the parking in the Heights. So yeah. um, I, I think it was a solid proposal. <coughs> okay, with a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five. And vote. Next. Uh, Report on the amending of Lake Street signs. Okay. 
<laughs> Any discussion from, if you want to call up? Yeah, um, so I guess I'll say that uh, the Officer Rateau's memorandum was particularly compelling to me. So currently, you can't turn onto these streets during rush hour. And so we'd had a request from one of the residents, and I, and I know that a lot of people are here to talk about it, and I'm very interested in hearing what they say, but I can tell you what my preliminary, based on what I've read, I, I still want to, I want to hear, but based on what I read, um, I'm, I would suggest we don't do anything. And the reason is uh, spelled out by Officer Rateau and that it's simply unenforceable, is that if we made it a residence only right-hand turn, it isn't something that they, uh, because they, there's no way to identify residents short of pulling everyone over, and you can't reasonably just pull everybody over who, who does it. So uh, for that reason, I would move, um, I guess, no, uh, follow, the, uh, follow the course of recommended no action. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? And could I say, as the speaker comes to the microphone, one of my questions would be, I know there was talk about a neighborhood meeting. Just <coughs> if you could update us on the status of that. Yeah, thank you, yes, Chair. Chair. Of course. Um, so my name is Leslie Bennett. I put the original warrant article in. Um, and at our last meeting, we discussed having a neighborhood meeting and getting community feedback. Um, I held a meeting on March 23rd at the Fox Library. Um, there was about a half a dozen people who came and we sat and talked about what other alternatives and what other suggestions people had and you know whether there was support for the idea or what other people thought about the idea. Um, generally speaking, the response from the community is very positive. Um, I distributed more than 700 flyers in the community so that everyone knew about the meeting at the Fox. Um, all up Lake Street, Mary Street, Margaret Street, Dorothy White, Edith, I mean, basically delivered by hand to the community notices about the um, community meeting, as well as a follow-up mm -hmm. to let people know about this meeting. And I also created a website called www.lakestreetsigns.org, so people could go online and they could, if, they, if this wasn't convenient, they could find out a little bit about why, they could, you know, sub have a little bit of discussion about it, make comments, sign a petition on the website. Um, so I, you know, in talking with people, the question about enforcement has certainly come up. And one of the um, ideas that I've heard is to have, you know, much like a resident parking sticker, when people are allowed to park in a residence only area, you'd have a sticker or a dot or a placard or some other kind of symbol to indicate that in fact, you are a resident, and it's plain to see. You don't have to stop them. You don't have to ask them. Um, and most of the people I talked to said they would be very happy to have a resident sticker, placard, sign on their dashboard, sign on their back window, I mean, wherever it would be most convenient. Um, you know, I've also heard a question about constitutionality, about whether it's actually constitutional. And I think if you take a look at the case law in Massachusetts, that you know the question in a constitutional analysis is whether it's rationally related to a legitimate state interest. And here, the state interest is, as we all know, the traffic on Lake Street is a problem. It's quite long. Um, that intersection was, in the traffic design report of 2009, rated an F because it's just not workable. And while we understand that there are changes coming with the Mass Ave Corridor project, that's a long way off, and that's many, many months to get to that point. Um, you know, the, the issue here is what can we do to allow people who live in the area to get off the main street, to have less cars in that area, and also to, to stop the emissions. I mean, if you're sitting in traffic for 10, 15, 20 minutes, unnecessarily, you could be home, you could be reducing the amount of people that are on the road, and you can turn your car off. All of those things, I think, would be considered a legitimate state interest. So the question is whether this provides an opportunity to actually accomplish that. Um, you know, there are other people who have comments, but I uh, was able to collect, you know, uh, probably about 80 signatures, either on the petition or the website. Um, I'd be happy to provide those names, or, you know, 
to provide a more comprehensive list of some of the other ideas that were discussed, such as speed bumps along Mary Street, such as um, putting in more signs on Mary Street, um, restricting turning in the morning as well as in the evening, because the morning commute is also a problem. Um, so there were many discussions and you know, opportunities for people to brainstorm what other ideas are, you know, what other ideas they have. I wasn't sure given the nature of this um, forum whether those are even you know, possible to discuss given there's actually one proposal before you. Any questions from the board? Yeah, just, so in the morning, you're not allowed to come out Mary Street and take a left or right on Lake? Um, you, yeah, I mean, you can, you can, so in effect, the no right turn lane provides for people to not cut through on Mary Street, right, in the evening. Right. But in the morning, you can do that. It's, the, you're allowed to take that right and cut through Mary Street, and the problem is, <coughs> that people go too fast, and particularly in the morning, there are kids going to school at eight o'clock to get to Hardy. So there's a lot of traffic during that commuting, out, those, that, that commuting time, in particular when you really don't want people yeah, going I what you're 40 about. miles down, you know. So that, that's basically the, the, the issue, Thank right, you. is the trying to prevent people from doing that. Any other questions from the board? What, may I ask, was Corey invited to your, was Officer Corey invited to your neighborhood meeting? No, I didn't, I didn't extend an invitation to the police department. I did talk to Chief Ryan. I mean, he did indicate, um, you know, the, the question about enforcement. Um, and I think that, you know, enforcement, like, like we already have rules about, I, I think this is analogous to parking. You know, if you're a resident, you can park on a public street only during certain times but non-residents can't do that, right? If you're not a resident, if you don't have a resident permit or you're not, you know, it's a, it's a similar kind of situation, treating a public street for a resident versus a non-resident, treating those two classes differently. Yeah. In general, we don't have resident only parking. Yeah, no, but in, but in, in other talking, places. Right, I'm yep. talking mm -hmm. generally okay. speaking, yep. when you treat two classes of individuals differently, that's the question about whether you can Got or it. whether you are able to, you know, it's a, it's a public street, yes, and everybody pays taxes, yes. Why is it that only some people can do some things at some times? Because there's a legitimate state interest. Great. Thank in, you very in, much. In taking that action and treating those two classes differently. Thank you. Um, anyone else in the audience, please come forward. Sure, I'm Jennifer Griffith, I live on Edith Street, so, I'm one of those people that has to wait all the way down, you know, to be able to get to my street. And um, I am very grateful uh, to Leslie for bringing this forward and organizing around this because it's been something that's been very problematic for a long time. Um, I've lived there for t over 20 years and most of the time I take the T to work, but I work downtown. Sometimes I can drive all the way from downtown Boston to Lake Street in less time then it takes me, if I do the right thing, and stay on Lake Street until I get to Birch where I can turn. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I'm all in favor of, I've seen in other places, there's accept residence on some signs. And I think the problem is that it can't just be that. It has to be hand in hand with a additional one or two stop signs on Mary Street, or I really like the idea of speed bumps on Mary Street. Because then, even if it's not enforceable and other people will also turn, it won't be as attractive. They won't do it when they can't just speed down Mary Street and speed bump, a couple speed bumps and at least one more stop sign would also help in the mornings without having to put restrictions on turning in the morning. But it would, you know, it would make it much less attractive for people to cut through. So I think a combination of letting us turn, please, <laughs> and because sometimes I'll, t I'll go into Kelwin Manor and go around, but those people don't want me driving through there just so that I'm technically not taking, you know, a left turn into, or a right turn, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just think it doesn't, 
it doesn't make any sense not to do it, but it has to be combined with at least one more stop sign on Mary Street, and I would love some speed bumps because that really slows people down. And the people that live in the neighborhood, we don't care if we have to stop or slow down because, you know, <coughs> that's our neighborhood. <coughs> and in the doing a stop sign and speed bump would help in the morning as well because it is a problem. Thank you. Any questions from the board? No. Hi, I'm Carol Phillips. I'm here with my husband, and we are residents of Mary Street. I wrote a letter, so I'm just going to. Um, and we were involved in the initial signage project, and at that time the police said the same thing, that they can't enforce it. Um, and particularly what I recalled was it's an inf that we're trying to use our police resources to enforce something for the convenience of residents. And we were given the choice of signs for everybody or no signs at all. And given the choice, I'm prepared to live with the inconvenience of sitting in traffic on Lake Street, which is horrific. And maybe what we should be talking about, about, about ways of dealing with the light or some other thing, but um, I, I'm, I'm prepared to stand behind the signs and keep the signs as is, rather than run the risk of losing them and having our neighborhood once again overrun by bypass traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joanne Kelly Avis, and I live at 18 Mary Street, and I live, li would like to give you just two quick examples. A number of years ago, I did turn right at the beginning of Lake Street, right off of Route 2. I was coming from Cambridge, actually, from my office, and I was stopped. <coughs> and the police officer wanted to give me a ticket, and I told him, I live, the, my car was on Mary Street. I said, I live on Mary Street. He said, let me see your license. I showed him the license, and he said, you cannot turn right. Uh, but I live on Mary Street, and I happen to live further down on Mary Street from where I turned. So he said there was no need for me to turn there. He let me go, and I came down Mary Street to the intersection of Birch and Mary, and I live at 18 Mary, and I'm on that corner of Birch and Mary Street. Another police car came off of Lake Street, and with his siren, uh, his light flashing, and stopped me, and pulled me over, and he said, where do you think you're going? I said, I'm going into my driveway. Well, he didn't like that. <laughs> Um, so it, it, I was only there briefly, and he did not give me a ticket. But more recently, my husband passed away um, in uh, October of 2010. And I was constantly going back and forth to the Brigham and Women's and the Dana-Farber. And they were long, drawn-out days, and we would get there oftentimes at 7.30 in the morning, be there all day for chemotherapy and all sorts of CAT scans and PET scans and so forth. By the time we came back, it was supper time. So we, if it wasn't in the summer, it was a good thing. If it was, we were fighting the Red Sox traffic, getting out of that medical area in, on Brookline Ave. And finally, we would get to Lake Street. And it would be bumper to bumper. Not only was my husband thoroughly exhausted, nauseous, questionable other prob, you know, things that might occur, and he wanted to get into the house, and I was pretty exhausted myself. But I couldn't turn right. And I have to admit that there were times that I took the chance and I turned right, saying to myself, if an officer stops me, I will tell him, this is the reason, this man who looks like he's 85 and is 61 years old, was just at the day in the fiber all day. You want to give me a ticket? Give it to me. So the third thing that I have to mention is that living at the corner of Birch and Mary Street, I am fortunate to see all the cars coming down through that intersection. The stop sign is on Birch. The stop sign is not on Mary. Now I sit outside, I have a little doggy, I walk him, and I, uh, I see so many cars, they're not stopping and going into a driveway, they're cutting through. I'm the you one know, paying the Kelly, taxes. I, just, I, I, I do agree, I think, although we're talking about, we're getting a little off topic with the traffic, um, 
you know, cutting through. I think that that's kind of a different issue that well, we you might discuss at a later time. Right now, we're, we're really just talking about, you know, turning the, move, the turning of the street signs, not traffic well, in the mornings, which I, I I'm understand. not talking about the morning. I'm just talking about the general traffic, mostly in the evening, and that is due to the people turning off of Lake Street and cutting through, speeding down Mary Street to Margaret, then they have to turn left to get mm -hmm. back out on Lake. No, I understand. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Sally Harris, or actually Sarah is the legal name. I live on Mary Street also. I live towards Little John, just beyond the Little John Mary Street intersection. And I have to say that the traffic is absolutely deplorable when people cut through. Um, so I'm, all, I'm for people being able to drive down the street, but we need to slow them down because there have been two accidents. There were, I think the most recent one was in 2012. And it wasn't horrible, but it, I'm waiting for the time that it is really bad because people have a blatant disregard for the stop sign coming down from Wilson to, towards Little John on Mary Street, and they bomb through. And then I get to hear them go, Whoa! Down, 120, um, down Mary Street like they're on 128. So, you know, I'm, I'm all for this, but we need to do something to curtail the, the speed that people um, choose to um, utilize to get down to the end of the street to get back on Lake Street like the nice woman just said. So if you could consider something like that, that would be great. Great, thank you. I'm Susan Martin, and I live on 79 Mary Street. And I think you have to live on Mary Street to appreciate what the residents are going through. Um, something has to be done, and if it was me, I'd, I'd um, I don't know, get a cadet police officer, have him write, write tickets to the people that are, are turning. The only way people are going to understand it if it hits their wallet. And, What's the use of having sign, whether it's residents, non-residents, because people are not obeying. That's really the issue. And I would really, really like to see the police down there ticketing. Uh, it, it, it's bad. It's bad. And if you have to live there, come home after a long day in here, Daytona 500 outside your window, it's, you wouldn't like it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I live near Birch and Mary, and I'd really like to see residents able to hang a right. It takes me longer to go from Route 2 to my house than it does to go from Burlington, where I work, to the Route 2 Lake Street exit. Um, so, you know, if residents had a sticker, a sticker or something, that would be great. Uh, and I'm sure they'd all be happy to, you know, pay for the printing of that sticker. It would save them a lot of time. Thank you. I agree with everything that she just said. We, we formerly lived on Mary Street. We now live on White Street. Uh, what, Mary Street has always been a problem as far as, because the, the stop signs aren't facing the proper direction. They should be facing Mary Street going down towards Lake Street because they, the people will go down there. It's not the people who live, the residents who live in the neighborhood who speed down the streets because we live there we know it, and and we should be able to make a right hand turn and get home a little bit faster than sitting there and sitting there and sitting there likewise i drive from uh, hanscom air force base and it takes me longer to negotiate lake street to my house where i can turn off on birch street than it does to drive from hanscom air force base home thank you I, ha I have a question either for the current or previous speaker. Oh. Um, the, the traffic, um, you were talking about getting police enforcement down there, and we do have limited resource, but right. when a problem is identified, it's something we can definitely act on. What my question would be is the Monday through Friday from 4 to 7 p.m., no right-hand turn, and where you say they are going through and going through fast. Do you know... Is it a particular day? Is it a particular time? Every day. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the just the, the speaker at the microphone. I'm trying to help here, guys. <laughs> it's, 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 it's every day. Okay, all right. And it's scoff laws, they, they will fine. turn anyhow. Right. 
the police aren't there to enforce the, the, the no turn uh, on a daily basis. Okay. So, it's, I mean, it's all the time. You know, they, they flip, a, flip a coin. Right. Thank you. And then in the summertime, it exacerbates the problem <coughs> because of the bike path. The people that are ri driving bicycles, riding bicycles, and, and walking the bike path don't, don't obey any kind of laws. The, the bicycles, there's a stop right. sign there, but they, they don't it's stop. All the time. Thank you, you know, very thank much. Thank you. So I just want to say about the bike path, I think that uh, that's a really good point. And I will say that there's uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee is currently looking at implement, implementing other solutions at the bike path crossing to change the traffic pattern such that it would be synchronized with the light so that we would permit more through traffic on lake. And so that obviously isn't done yet, and obviously the recommendations aren't out there. But uh, I, I, we have members of the Transportation Advisory Committee here tonight, so th I, I know that they're listening to that. So um, I just want to, on that particular point, I want to say that that one is one that we've, I personally have heard several times before, and, I'm, and I've tracked down enough to know that we're making forward progress on it. Though I, I understand that that's only part of what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, if, if we're going to talk, we have to come to the microphone. Um, next, please. Uh, Peter Fiore, Precinct 2. I live on Mott Street. Um, I'm a little vexed that you, you've already voted, you've already voted no change, right? No. No. Okay. Haven't you voted just yet. voted to accept Officer Coteau's report? No, we haven't taken we haven't any voted okay. yet. Um, as far as his, his report that the change the law to residents only, and I'm not standing here to advocate that necessarily, is unenforceable. I mean, no, no traffic law is enforceable unless the police spot check it. Speeding on Mass Ave, Lake Street, Mystic Street, uh, intersections where people fail to stop. I mean, right now the police only spot check down there as it is. So. If they're down there spot checking to stop people from turning right, then I don't see any problem with them spot checking and pulling everybody over on a given day that they're spot checking to make sure that that individual is a resident. So, I mean, yeah, it, it is enforceable if you do pull everybody over on those days where you spot check. Um, I come, come with more questions than answers. I went to the meeting at the Fox. I was up here 15 years ago with a group of citizens like this when people were getting pulled over and actually ticketed. Um, and I guess I'm going to fall back now to what I said back then is, uh, I mean, I'd like to try to get the police out of the equation since it's only enforceable if, if they are down there. If we want to kind of keep along the lines or the way that we have it now, similar to what we have now, it seems to me the intelligent solution initially would have been to make it no, you know, it's no problem nobody turning right, people turning right off a lake, it's when they turn left onto Mary. So why aren't there signs that say no left turn on Mary 4 to 7? Um, and, and, and do that, or the alternative, I think, and, and I'm sorry, this is what I said 15 years ago, keep Mott Street a one-way, make Mary Street a one-way from Margaret down to Wilson, and make Wilson do not enter. Then you've removed the incentive for anybody to race up Mary Street. I've always been in the opinion, and unfortunately, the more I drive, the, the more that opinion erodes, that people are less likely to go the wrong way up a one-way than they are to turn right against a, a no right turn sign four mm -hmm. to seven. That would still allow the residents to turn right at Little John and, and go over to Dorothy and up Dorothy and to Parker and Birch so the folks on Mary Street could still get home without sitting in traffic. But those folks that want to race up Mary Street to, to get up to Margaret and cut ahead of people and, and not wait in line, their incentive would be, would be eliminated morning and, and, and evening. Uh, I, I know I've probably got neighbors here that hate me right now for stating that, so I'm glad I was reelected to town meeting on Saturday. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. But, uh, but that's, that's what I have to say. I, I, I hope uh, if, if it stays the way it is, so be it. But I, I think there are probably better changes. And furthermore, while I'm on my soapbox, there are a lot of traffic and parking issues in the neighborhood these days. Uh, folks race down Margaret and Birch to get to Thorndike Field. It used to be a three-season experience. Now with the dog park, it's year round. Now that the bike path is, is plowed in the winter, you know, the traffic problem I think is exacerbated. I'm not complaining about those things, but, but there may be even better solutions to, to, to uh, address some of those issues and, and maybe you make the neighborhood kind of a cul-de-sac and you close Margaret and Wilson or, I don't know, those are just, just random thoughts I have right now, but. Uh, Thank you very much. But anyway, much. thanks. Thanks. Um, Anyone, anyone else in the crowd? Um. I just have a question, because we heard a lot of great things that aren't exactly on this particular yeah. question that you're supposed to be contemplating. So how do we advance? You know, like, I love that one way, um, one way that, thing. That's awesome. I hadn't that's thought of that. That's something that we're actually, I think we're going to discuss right now. Oh, okay. So. 
Thank you. Um, Ms. Mahan. Um, just a few things. I, if I could, through the chair, um, ask the town manager perhaps to briefly speak to the speed bump issue. Uh, in terms oh, of, I I'm believe, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, the speed bump issue on public ways. So I, I, I won't speak for a member, you know, as a member of TAC or um, for the DPW director, but I'm certain their response would be that it's very challenging to do so because you can't plow the streets if there's a speed bump. Uh, I know there is some plowable speed bump technology, but uh, we, we've not yet uh, taken that step in Arlington. So spe speed bumps would be a challenge for us in Arlington. And then um, the only other two points would be, um, first of all, um, th through the chairman and the town manager, um, perhaps <clears throat> consulting with the police chief about getting some more spot checks down um, between four to seven um, when manpower, people power allows. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the suggestions that sort of go beyond the scope um, of what's before us, as well as what's before us tonight, I know when this process years ago, um, I wasn't quite on the board yet, but I was out in the audience, there was a massive neighborhood um, outreach in terms of um, notifying people, going door to door, getting the two-thirds rule. Um, and I know you had, I'm sorry, you referenced the meeting and um, about, a, I think it was a dozen people or so came. What I would say in, in answer to the query in terms of some of these other good ideas is probably twofold. Um, first of all, what I'm hearing is a stop sign on Mary Street towards Lake, and then um, the suggestion of leave Mata one way, make Mary one way, and make Wilson a do not enter. I think before any of that can happen, with the exception of perhaps we could refer to the Officer Rateau, the stop sign on Mary towards Lake Street. But on the others, um, that's where the neighborhood outreach needs to be done and then come back to the board and maybe we can get a sense of, unless my colleagues can think of some other solution, but before we make a, you know, a re if we make any kind of change like that. But in terms of what's before us here tonight, I would, um, and from what I'm hearing from <coughs> the residents here as well as some residents who contacted me in person and from East Arlington, I would go in concert with the recommendation that we have from Officer Rato right now on, on this issue. Kevin. You know, um, I don't know how long ago it was, but a lot of these rules and regulations that have been put in place was because of the neighbors coming to us begging us to not let cars take the right because they were charging through up to Mass Avenue and there were serious safety concerns and now, you know, uh, and this is, clearly not the only place we have traffic and parking issues. They're, they're around town. It, unfortunately, we're a, we're a smaller town. And while I'm hesitant to do this, I think what we should do is let's refer this to TAC. You know, there's a lot of ideas out there. There's obviously a lot of neighbors. There's a lot of, and I know we're hesitant to do that because TAC is very, uh, that's our Transportation Advisory Committee. They're very overloaded, but they are very thorough in terms of their study. But all of the neighbors have to be included, including those up north of Hardy School, if that would be north, I forget. But there was a much larger group here back then who were begging us to stop cars uh, at night, taking a right, and then shooting through up to Mass Avenue so that they could avoid Lake Street. So uh, we are never going to have a perfect solution uh, in any neighborhood. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, but we don't, you know, we can't go on, you know, just wild ideas tonight. Uh, we need to have a coordinated effort, and as I say, all the neighbors need to be included in this that live in that entire neighborhood because they're all the ones that are suffering with this. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. Mr. Dunn, I'm sorry, miss. It, we're discussing this now. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, um, I'm persuaded that the problem on Mary Street is something that we should be looking, that we should try to figure something out about. And um, I think that the Transportation Advisory Committee is a, probably a good place for this. I will say that, um, like sort of similar to what Kevin just said, in some ways what we're, the, the challenge here is uh, it's like a bubble under a piece of plastic. It's like when you push the pl traffic problem out of one place, it pushes it into another. And, and we have, uh, and I see some head shaking, but I, I, but I still believe that, um, I, I don't know that there is a perfect solution that actually solves the problem in East Arlington. I just, I think that it's a density and traffic problem that's gonna be uh, a challenge for us no matter what. But that does not mean that there isn't improvement possible because I, I do think that there is an improvement possible. Uh, so I would, 
and I'm also particularly interested in seeing how some of the things that we're trying to do to relieve the traffic on Lake Street itself improve this, because a lot of this is symptoms of this terrible traffic problem on Lake. And if we can solve the root of the Lake Street problem, that, we, that will go a long way towards, uh, towards some of these other uh, traffic problems we have. So. Um, I, I would be very interested. I think I would. I would be interested in referring uh, this the bet back to tech. I know when we when we looked at when we looked at this a month ago, we we checked when the last time TAC had looked at this. Does any? But I don't remember off the top of my head that, what that was. Does anyone happen to know? No. I, sorry. It was definitely. It was within the last ten years, but it wasn't within the last four or something like that. Yeah, I think it was their right. recommendations that. We, we yeah. did the no right turn. So, so I guess that I would, um, if with with Mrs. Mahan's permission, I'd like to amend my motion and refer uh, the traffic problems on Mary Street to TAC as well. Yeah. Uh, is that you? That, that's what I'd like to amend my motion with and permission of the. Mm -hmm. Would you consider can, adding the language of the whole neighborhood, not just Mary Street? Yeah. Right. There, yes. We're looking at the whole neighborhood, but specifically with the center or with the yes, with an aim towards resolving the or improving the Mary Street situation, and but making sure that we don't. TAC is very good at making sure we don't mess with the rest of the neighborhood as well. I agree. Um, I'll second the motion. So we have a, that, a, Mrs. Mahan. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second. And, and was there agreement in terms of the chair and the town manager referring the current um, issue of possible increasing patrolling down there? Yeah, yeah. That's we'll apparent. work with the town manager. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Yes, thank, thank you, you for reminding me. Um, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Five nothing. Thank you. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We want to find a solution to yes. this as well. Trust me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Moving, moving on, we now have our warrant article hearings. Um, we'll start with Article 16, uh, Bylaw Amendment 55 Venner Road, removal of easement restriction. Uh, Mr. Manning. Thank you. So this is a 10 registered voter article submitted by uh, the property owners at 55 uh, Venner Road. And this is an issue that dates back, I believe, to 2006 town meetings, so there may be some familiarity uh, with this issue. And the, the core of the issue here is in 1942, the town took what was called exterior lines, which would have allowed the town to, I believe, extend Spring Street through this property. Um, they didn't actually take full, the town didn't take full possession of the land, but again, rather this terminal, uh, terminology known as exterior lines. And at that time, the town paid the then property owner $2,161 for those exterior lines. Uh, time has passed. The current owners bought the property, I believe, in 1962? Is that 62? Uh, the Kakaris family, uh, who, who's here tonight, uh, Mary's here, and uh, has lived there, has lived in the property since. Uh, and back in 2006, and again now, the family has been petitioning the town to lift the exterior lines or to release its authority to eventually extend a road through, uh, through the property. The town no longer has any need or desire to put a road through the property. However, in looking uh, at the situation in the past and, and presently, uh, I've tried to approach this so that the town would be compensated for its initial investment uh, as well as be compensated for tax revenue that has been foregone. And that's because this sliver of land has been taxed at an unbuildable rate since 1942. Uh, and if the town was to release exterior lines, it would become buildable and therefore have a higher value. 
Uh, and not to get too deep into that argument, but in that case, the property owners would have had the benefit of a large yard taxed at a lower rate, and then the next day, if the lines were released, have the benefit of a buildable lot and its value. Um, the other remaining point or point from 2006 that still remains today is the concern of a butters. And if the town did decide to release these lines, what would the impact on a butters be? Um, and the property owners have negotiated with the most immediate abutter uh, to <coughs> sell a piece of the property if the town was to release the exterior lines to create a buffer zone so that any potential future development on that lot would be buffered uh, between the abutter and the, this lot. So working with uh, the family's uh, attorney, uh, Attorney Leone, uh, as well as in discussing the family, today we have reached, uh, actually just a few hours before the meeting, reached an agreement uh, whereby the I would propose to the, uh, to the Board of Selectmen, who would thereby propose to town meeting, release of the lines uh, for financial compensation. And that compensation would be a, a total of $65,000. And that would be representative of the present value of the 2161, for which the exterior lines were originally taken in 1942. And that comes out to just about $30,000. Uh, and then the remainder of that sum would come from looking back and we could call it a rollback tax, looking back 15 years uh, worth of taxes. And you can see I, we've, uh, the assessors have done an analysis, the amount that would have been charged had the lot been buildable and what um, the lot or that piece of the lot had actually been paid for uh, during those years. And that difference comes out to approximately $35,000. We, we picked a 15-year window uh, looking at um, Another <clears throat> not like but similar general law whereby a use of a property was changed. Um, general law speaks to rollback taxes that have a certain finite amount. So some could say, why don't you go all the way back to 1942 when the lines were taken? Uh, but based on uh, what seemed to be somewhat of a precedent in mass general law, that seemed excessive. Uh, so again, in conversations um, with the family and with Attorney Leone, we've seen that uh, it at least appears that the abutters who uh, may have the most concern uh, have been satisfied through this potential land uh, deal, uh, and we've come to a financial agreement that I can sincerely recommend to the board as being, uh, I think, a benefit to the town and, and right, uh, you know, properly and rightly compensating the town, uh, but also being uh, fair for the property owners. And uh, I'll let them speak for themselves, but that's what my uh, what my recommendation is to the board here tonight. Mr. Chaplain, any questions from the board? Yeah. Kevin, uh, just recommend favorable action. Second. But Mr. Leone, I'm, I'm yeah. lived to hear you, sir. If there's something you want to add? Motion a second. It was, uh, to, yep. was Mahan second. Um, I'm here with, with Denise Long and her mom, Mary Kukaris, and Dan Long. Mary's lived there, like Adam said, since the 60s. The house is, an, as you can picture it, an upside down house. The kitchen, the bathrooms, the main bedrooms are on the second floor. Mary needs to move. She's been trying to sell the house, mm -hmm. but we can't sell it because of the lot lines. So after about $15,000 of other lawyer fees, the title company said no way it can sell it, which is what brings us back to town meeting this time. We, we tried in 2006, and it didn't work. Um, this time, we have spoken to the Wrens. We've gotten a, a written agreement with them to transfer 2,500 square feet which would serve two purposes. It gives them a nice, almost 50-foot buffer or more between their house and any potential house that could be built. And it will limit Mary's lot to two buildable lots instead of three, which, you know, Dan and Denise live on the other side of the rent, so they're interested the in... Butter. Yeah, the, the other <laughs> butters. So they're interested in keeping the neighborhood less dense and not squishing three houses in. So I think it's a win for the town getting rid of that getting some reimbursed for the ones they put in, uh, get two lines, and it's gonna help Mary get out of the house and move into a, she wants to move to a condo in Arlington. So she wants to stay with us, she doesn't wanna go away. Um, which is- But we won't hold her to that. No, I think she's not going. After teaching in the high school all those years, she doesn't wanna go anywhere. Um, so I think for all of us, the, the Longs, Ms. Gokaris, the rents, the, and the town, it's a good, good solution and we'll finally get rid of one of these problems that's been nagging. Just to make it clear, I'm gonna step down on this article. Um, I've been Dan and Denise and Mary's friends for 20 something years, so that's why I'm helping them out. I can't do both, so I'll step down and have my assistant take care of it at town meeting. So if you have any other questions for us, um, 
glad to go ahead. Okay. Any questions from the board? No, just, just, uh, Mr. Gunn? Um, there's, n there's no particularly delicate way to phrase this, but uh, I would love to hear the Wren, like, uh, could you tell me more about the, the Wrens with us? Joe, yeah. Joe yeah. oh, uh, perfect. Wren is here and um, Joe Fahey's, who's yeah. been helping me um, come to an agreement with them. Hi, good evening, uh, Joseph Fahey. Uh, I represent uh, Donner and Christopher Wren. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah. I, I think it's, uh, I'd be happy to entertain your questions, Mr. Dunn. Uh, my only question is, is I just wanted to, I want to understand that, that, you, that you're, you, you, all, you really agree, are happy with this plan going forward. I, I, I think the best way to describe the situation is, is the, the acrimony resulted the last time this matter was presented to the town. Uh, Denise Long reached out uh, to my clients uh, in an effort to address this before it get to this stage. My clients aren't here to uh, advocate that the town uh, agree to any particular compensation package or uh, advise anyone at town meeting how they ought to vote on this matter. What they recognized was if uh, this were to pass as this town warrant is currently constructed, uh, an ambitious developer may attempt to shoehorn three homes into this lot. Uh, and they thought it were in their interest to purchase this, uh, enough land so that would uh, that effort would be inhibited, uh, and the uh, they would preserve the character of the of the neighborhood and the uh, the land adjacent to their lot. And of course, this is just contingent on favorable action being taken on the Warren article. Uh, the other uh, uh, item I think ought to be brought to the town's attention is the amount of property being acquired by the Wrens if this were to proceed would not be such that it would enable them to develop a lot. They have no development the ambitions themselves up there, and uh, their, their interest is just in sincerely uh, preserving the general character of the neighborhood that they moved into when they bought. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Long. Uh, hi, Denise Long. I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, I think the issues have been fairly well um, laid out. Um, originally, when my parents approached the selectmen in town meeting, their original interest, objective, if you will, was to build a handicapped accessible lot on the other section of their property. Um, but that didn't pass, uh, as town manager indicated, because of uh, an inability to come to an agreement on the compensation issues. This time around, however, since my dad has passed away and my mother has a bad back, I mean, she's not looking to develop the property, but we're well aware that that could happen. And so, in the past, we were also trying to prevent there from being more than the existing house and one additional one. And this compromise agreement would accomplish that. It would limit any future owner, if they wanted to do something with it, to just the existing house, one additional lot. And then there would be a 2,500 square foot buffer, which the Wrens would acquire, that would not only benefit them, but the neighborhood as a whole, to preserve the character of the neighborhood, not only for everyone, but also, you know, for, for anyone, you know, in the greater reaches there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments from the board? I would just say uh, thank you to everybody for working on this. This is one of these issues where I was looking, looking at it with some dread, um, <laughs> expecting it could be filled with some, you know, acrimony and complexity and everything to see everything, um, you know, nicely negotiated and, and essentially delivered to us to, uh, in, a, in a form that I think I can comfortably support. I Thank you, you all. I, uh, I do appreciate the civility that was used throughout this process. I, um, I know that can be not very easy at times, and I commend everyone involved. Um, so that we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to you two. Thank you. Moving on, uh, <coughs> Article 24, endorsement of CDBG application. Uh, Mr. Dunn, I So uh, I don't think we're actually asking for the board's endorsement tonight. Uh, what I think we should do is uh, make a will report. And so I move that we make a motion of will report. What you do have on your Second. table is, uh, it, was, it was on our desk, it, the subcommittee met this morning at eight o'clock. Um, and we did come to a draft budget that we more or less agree on, but obviously this board needs more time to digest it before it actually approves it. Uh, just a couple notes on the, what we're doing that are that's significant. 
Uh, there is one new public, like totally new public service that we haven't supported before, which is uh, the I Can Shine Learn to Bike program, which is something that happened in the town, I think it was last year with corporate donations, and we're not fully recommending it be supported, but we are trying to give it uh, $2,000 of support, or almost $2,000 of support. Uh, the Another important uh, one, I think, is uh, under public facilities and improvements, $80,000 for historic preservation um, for the Jason Cutter and uh, 23 Maple Street. Uh, and the other one I wanted to talk about, oh, was the Housing Authority Life and Skills Center building, uh, Life, and, Life and Skills Center building. The Housing Authority, like, you know, like many groups, submits more than, you know, we can meet. And in the end, after uh, Steve in particular had conversations with them that led us to focus on supporting the Life and Skills Center building. Um, and one other note that I'll make on this is the, we were able to fund, see, if you see the bottom right, the draft budget says 1.476 million. Mm -hmm. um, 270 odd thousand of that is one-time money. So our actual annual number, which is consists of the amount that the federal government gives us, plus program income that comes in, is what adds up to the, um, I'm sorry, did I say 2.1? You said 1.2? Yes. said about 270,000. 270, thank you, yes. good, all right, yeah, the 1.2, sorry. I, um, and so that 270,000 of one-time money comes from, we went through and we cleaned up a bunch of projects that had money outstanding that had been rolling over and rolling over, but the project either we were all able to say, you know, if they actually want to do this, they're gonna have to come back with another funding, and there's a couple that we just said, you, you know, your time has expired on these. So uh, that, that two extra 270, or extra, so to speak, largely benefited the housing, the Arlington Housing Corporation and the Arlington Housing Authority, and so we just have to be smart in our conversations with them that there was a lot of one-time money in there. So I think we do no will we'll, no uh, will report. And then we can vote on this in our, the next perhaps next week's meeting, and then we can put it on the chairs. I think Mr. Carroll seconded it. Did I yeah, yes, I believe so. Yes, Ms. Mahoney. Um, if I could sort of a segue into that, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, um, mm -hmm. just to, um, through the chairman and the town manager, I know that when we look under public facilities and improvements and. The only part that I think it could be applicable um, of CDBG monies for the North Union Park and Spray Pool. I know that the Park and Rec Commission, I believe they've held two public meetings um, and had two or three draft plans out there. I would just ask the chairman and um, the town mm -hmm. manager, when it gets to the point that um, we're ready to say, let's go. I know I was contacted by one of the Park and Rec Commissioners and I spoke to the town manager who said, you know, process wasn't that far along. But whenever it is deemed the appropriate time, um, just sort of as an FYI, and I know it will be done anyways, wh whatever is the soonest that you, the Park and Rec and Town Manager and Mr. Conley are comfortable that the board could get a copy of the actual um, proposed plans for North Union and the spray pool. Yeah, we, we actually have an awarded contract, so I can provide that to the board. Okay, just so we're well versed with it, because I know as selectmen, of people course. will ask us what's going in, as well as maybe if you could just provide a small paragraph just sort of summarizing that and I'm just doing this from memory, and I could be incorrect that there were two public meetings, that the Park and Rec Commission has had it on their agenda, you know, just sort of a compilation so people could say, well, what happened here? You know, was, was there public outreach? And so just a short little, thank, thank you. you very much. Kevin? Yeah, um, so I just wanted to ask Dan, so the Housing Authority Life and Skills Center, they requested 100,000. Yep. And we're giving them 200,000. <laughs> yep. It's, uh, I, I can, I mean, yeah, yeah. If, um, yeah uh, so they, uh, so the, the cost of the th of the building is 400,000. And in a previous year, they requested all 400,000. Yeah. And then this year, they only requested 100,000. They also requested 500,000 for Drake Village, and they requested um, uh, more m money for an affordable condo, and so on and so forth. And I think that when, when conversations, when Steve had conversation with them saying, you know, you need to focus a little bit more and help us prioritize. They said, well, what we really, really want to do mm -hmm. is the Life and Skills Center, and we're going to be able to get ma some ma matching money, especially if we can demonstrate that we're serious about it. Mm -hmm. And so that was how that is. So they are revising, um, we have, before we finalize this, we will ask them to revise their request. So it's not make up money. You know, they actually, they asked for the 400 before. Well, 
They asked for a 100 here, I understand. They did. If, uh, but if and I can, well, our, your chair, you get to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I have to keep that in mind. <laughs> um, you know, I, um, I spoke with uh, Mr. Griffin, and he is going to send over a revised number. Right. Um, and I think that, I, I'm not speaking for him, but I would assume that when anyone's putting together CDBG applications, and they're already asking for a lot of a lot of money for one program and two programs. And then what we see is that a lot of groups tend to like to stockpile funding from year to year. And I think that might have been the strategy um, with this Life and Skills Center building. Um, that being said, I am more than comfortable awarding this because it is a phenomenal program. Um, it will go a long way for the whole monotony manner um, and what I think in as part of an overall strategy, it will be incredibly beneficial. You know, I, I'm sure of that, as I believe every one of these will be incredible and deserve funding. Uh, I would be far more comfortable if we gave them the 100,000 they originally requested and give them just 100,000 towards affordable housing up top where they asked for 200,000. Um, this negotiating with them, I'm not really overly comfortable with. If we give you 200, where do you want it, kind of. But, but this board is well aware. I have always been uncomfortable with us, the Board of Selectmen, a local agency, taking federal money and giving it to a state agency. However, and you've heard me sing this song before, um, if this is what my colleagues come and recommend, I will always support my colleagues. But I just want to state, I would be much more comfortable with 100,000 towards affordable up top. And, give them the 100 they requested under the others. And I understand we're saying no to 500,000. <coughs> but you know, the, the, they've requested from us $800,000 of a little over a million. I mean, you know, uh, how realistic are they now that each year they, they're, they're increasing significantly what they're asking us for. And so we end up with, well, we can't do all of that, but we'll give you 200. So anyhow, shut up, Kevin. I'm Duly, talking too much tonight. Duly noted. <laughs> Mr. Dunn. Not to poke the bear, but there is an element that I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me move right now. Just hold me back. <laughs> uh, the, one of the things that we did as a part of this is, is that last year, this board voted $50,000 towards item number three, which is the uh, affordable, the, that condo. Yeah. And part of what we're, part of the request for this year is going to be re repurpose that 50 from last year towards the life science. So they really are putting, so we're putting all, like all of their eggs from this year and last year in one basket, which is the life, science, life skills building. But would you let them know next year, I'd appreciate that that's what they come here with. This is what we'd really like funding for. This money should be our priorities, not, not, you know, anyhow, anyhow, sure. shut up, Kevin. Just Thank shut you. the hell up. Um, I agree. Moving on, so we have a motion. Yeah, so we will be voting. Motion yeah. of will report. Will report. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Five nothing. Thank you. Then we have final votes and comments. Article, move approval. Article eight bylaw amendment. Second. I'll read it anyway. Article eight <laughs> bylaw amendment regulation of outdoor lighting. Dark skies bylaw. Article 21, amendments to the District Agreement of the Minuteman Regional Vocational School District. Uh, we have a motion to second any further discussion. Ms. Mahan. I suspect um, to the chair and to the town manager that the answer is probably no, but um, the notice that um, the town manager has provided us regarding the meeting at Western Town Hall and that member community, um, would the result of any vote coming out of that affect? No. Have, thank you. Thank you. What, you got an, what was the answer? No, no, uh, th 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 that Monday, that up. meeting Monday oh. is really to garner support for other communities to take a similar action that the board's taking. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Number 11, update from the Route 128 Business Council. Mr. Chaplain. So uh, it was probably just about a year ago that we officially introduced the board to the Route 128 Business Council and the town joining the council uh, as its, I think, second municipal member. And we thought it was uh, <clears throat> right time with um, some of the progress that's been made by the council for uh, Monica and Patrick from the council to update the board on the work they've done and the plans they have uh, for continuing to work with Arlington going forward. So we have Monica Tibbetts and Patrick Sullivan. 
Thanks for bearing with us tonight. I've been here all night. Thank you. It's totally okay. Um, so in front of you, you have kind of, and I, ex I have a cough, so um, in front of you, you have a project update. So the first thing that we did is we went through and looked at all of the data that we could find on the town. So we used the most recent town census. We contacted CTPS, the Central Transportation Planning staff, to get their transportation data on Arlington. Um, we also worked with the MBTA to get their ridership statistics on the town of Arlington, kind of looked at a little bit of everything. Um, because initially, you know, we'd been asked to look at, you know, maybe looking at shuttle service, maybe looking at this, maybe looking at that. But what we want to do is get a very good understanding from a data standpoint what the existing conditions of the town were. Um, and so in looking at that, you have a pretty decent amount of public transit service. I mean, we can argue whether everyone is happy with that, but just looking as compared to other communities, you have a pretty decent supply of public transit at this point, and you have pretty decent usage of that public transit. Um, and so at that time, we did not recommend doing any shuttle service. I think that looking at this, now I'm not saying that that wouldn't change in the future, but I just think that that money would be better allocated other places. And so what we did look at is what can we improve? What can we do here? So the first thing we looked at is trying to better move people through the community, um, especially when it comes to uh, weekend night traffic and things like that. So we've been working with the Economic Development and Tourism Committee to come up with the tourism map. That was one of the first things we took on after doing the data analysis. This is a previous draft of the tourism map, and right now what we're doing is working with the committee to add um, descriptions to this, to describe each of the historic sites that they had outlined, and we're also putting this in a web format. Because one of the things we looked at is it's a very large map, and it would be very expensive to print. And so what we're doing right now is we're putting it into a web format where it would be an interactive web map. So people could go on it, look at the entire community, but also look at specifically the tourism sites, descriptions about it, uh, Google Earth shots of it, and really kind of work with the map. And so the targeted deadline to finish that is probably the end of this month. Um, we're going to have the next draft of this probably within the next week or two um, for the committee to also then comment on. So I'm very optimistic we're going to definitely get this out before summer. Um, and we will also deal with the marketing for that as far as getting the word out through the town's website and other um, avenues. The other thing we're looking at is Bike Week. That is one of the more immediate things that are coming up. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Bike Week. Um, May is the annual celebration of biking in Massachusetts. Um, Bike Week is a really big deal in the Commonwealth. Um, we've been participating in it for almost the entire 20 years it's been going on. And we've also worked with the town of Lexington as far as setting up their bike week activities. So this year we're actually going to have a bike breakfast in Arlington. Um, we're working with the Kickstand Cafe. They're going to be hosting it. Um, it's tentatively scheduled for May 9th. Um, and from about 6.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. we are going to be putting on a breakfast for all of the commuters coming through the bike path and through the area. Um, also during that we will be um, registering people for Bike Week, which is a competition um, between all the local businesses in the Commonwealth, different communities in the Commonwealth, colleges, universities, and we'll be able to register people on site for that, in addition to giving out Bike Week t-shirts and kind of all the other kind of accoutrement that goes with doing Bike Week. Um, so I would say that's probably the more immediate thing we're doing right now. And then the other two things we're looking at is we put together a draft survey, which you have in front of you. Um, and this is very much so in draft form. We've gotten initial comments back from the planning department. And what we're doing is trying to understand beyond the data that we had existing, kind of filling in the holes. Um, and a lot of that is understanding a little bit deeper how people are commuting and what different modes they're using and kind of how better we can steer that and make some mode shifts. Um, and so that survey basically captures that and also looks at how people are interacting with bike sharing, um, th things like Hubway and Zaxx are within neighboring communities, and also understanding how people are carpooling and using more non-traditional modes of commute within the community. Um, so obviously we'd love you to take a look at that draft and get any comments back because this is something we would like to get out, I would probably say within the next several weeks, maybe a month, um, get this out to the community and really start getting some of these answers <coughs> back. Because this is looking at things that have not traditionally been asked, building off of you know the town census, building off of the data that MassDOT keeps, and really kind of going kind of three more levels down to really understand if you have money, where can it better be targeted? If you don't have money, what slight changes can we make to kind of shift these modes to re you know, relieve congestion and help people better commute within and outside of the community? So it's kind of like a very quick and dirty overview of kind of what we're up to. So I'd welcome any questions or comments. Mr. Kira. 
Thank you very much. Um, I, I first wanted to say that um, Monica has been working with ATED and running the, the versions of the tourism map, map past um, a, a number of representatives from ATED, so I appreciate that. It, it really does look, look great when you get, we can see it closer and on the screen. I mean, I think you get, get the sense and there, there are a number of uh, locations there that I had never heard of, to tell you the truth before. There, there are a number we had never heard of and we're like, whoa, that's really cool. Running to Wikipedia. <laughs> Um, so thank you for the work on that. Um, I've had, uh, how do I say that? How do I say this stealthily? I've had occasion to be standing in the center for hours on end during rush hours and weekends the last couple of weeks <laughs> and to see the number of bikers. That, I, I don't know. Um, to see the number of bikers who have been, been um, coming through, you really get a sense of, of you know, there really are clusters. I mean, it's not just onesies, twosies. We, we have real clusters of bikers coming through um, that particular location. Um, and reading your um, <clears throat> commute to work statistics, I'm, I'm really wondering who the hardy soul is who rides their bike to Wilmington. Um, that, that seems like murder, especially this winter. Um, one question I had is you're recommending in here is that if we go the route of uh, bike sharing that we look at Zagster, it was just, this is just, this was a preliminary discussion okay. um, and that, and one of the things that we had opted for is trying to look at cost benefit. Yeah. Um, Hubway obviously would be the obvious choice. I mean, if you're going to go with the grade A best possible option, that would be it because you can, can connect to the other communities that are already using it. The biggest issue there is the cost. Right. Um, and I'm not saying that it's not worth it. It's just more we want to give you other options. And the town planning committee had already been looking, the planning department had already been looking at Hubway. So we wanted to present another option that I think that they had maybe not looked at. And Zagster um, is one of those options. And it just is an example of one of those options. And it's basically, it's a smaller version of Hubway. Instead of the locking mechanism and the system being built into the actual station, it's built into the bike. And so it's a much more cost-effective way to do bike sharing, but you don't get the connectivity that you would with a system like Hubway. This is more kind of one-off, and it's mainly been utilized by universities, um, different property developments, apartment complexes, things like that. And the main reason I brought it up is I think people often get very focused on just Hubway, like it, as if it's the only option, and it is a fantastic option. And I think if money wasn't an issue, that would be what I would recommend before anything else. But with that, we were just, these are some other options that if bike sharing is something that the community wants to do, there are different ways that you can do it at different price points. And that's kind of where the Zagster came into play. Right, right, okay. That's why I was, I was curious about that because it does seem that with something like Hubway, the connectivity is, is a big deal. Um, yeah, you can't Especially when we're talking about compete. commuting, so. Yeah, you cannot compete with that at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, the only other question I had is, um, this was very interesting, um, this, um, program in Kansas that you that you focus on. Are you aware of anything like that that's been tried in other um, regions of the country? I'm just, I'm wondering if there's a more trusting culture maybe in the, in the um, It's coming, Midwest. it's in New Jersey right now. It is. Um, New Jersey is just now piloting it. There are, there are no statistics and no data from them at this point. Okay. I think they've maybe had it in place three or four months because I knew that question was going to come up because there's a very big difference between Kansas and here. Right. Um, but yeah, basically I've been working with the research department that has been overseeing this um, because it did come through um, APTA and that's how I became aware of it is I sat on a review board that they presented this research I was like, oh, it's really interesting. So they are piloting on the East Coast right now. I would say we'd probably have some data on that maybe the end of the summer okay. as far as acceptance rates, um, also the police strategy, how the police were involved with trying to enforce yeah. it and things like that. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Mr. Greeley. Marie, is the heat on? And will you please put on the air conditioning or something? It is unbelievable in here. I'm about to crack and take off my jacket. <laughs> yeah, like, I am seriously. It's unbelievable, like, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's just so hot, huh? We can't turn on AC? See what we ran for, Dan? I know. <laughs> See how they treat us? No. Sorry. And nice work. Thank you very much. You're very uh, welcome. The, can I ask this, this, the age of people in Arlington and the age of those who use the MBTA, right? Yes. So 21% are under 18 but only 5% under 18 actually use the MBTA. Yes, sir. Hmm. So kids are being driven all over the place. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, and probably not biking, I would guess. No, sir. You know, when I was in uh, Paris a few years back, I couldn't get over those, you know, the rent a bike, pick it up one place and yeah. drive it 
uh, and return it uh, another place, the, uh, the uh, car uh, uh, method. And the, oh, what's the bike one at Brattle Street? What's that bike? Oh, um, the bike shop. Uh, huh? Uh, what's the name? Oh, oh, oh Rooster's shop. Name. Uh, <laughs> holy cow. But I think they're doing Plus that like now. A... Outside, I noticed outside on Saturday, they have like 10 bikes lined up that are the same type of bike with baskets and stuff. Oh, Quad cycle, okay. right? I yeah. When you said on so the I was, I'm, I'm just wondering whether that's what they were doing and stuff. But uh, I'm trying to get more and more into biking, uh, so I hope to show up on May 9th for you. But well, we we will be very happy to have give you. Give me a lot of room as I approach the table. That's <laughs> all that I'm going to tell you. I'll walk it in, okay? Just, just You'd so you would appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Um, I got a, a few questions. So, in terms of like t looking at the part where we talk about what, how people commute. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I bike to Alewife, and sometimes I drive to Alewife. Mm -hmm. Am I a biker, a driver, or a commuter, and how, or, or, or a public transporter, and how does that show up? You're counted as all. Okay. Um, yes, basically anything you mark down, you will be counted as such, um, which is the same as how we're doing the draft survey. We want to understand every single mode that people are using, so we don't, you, it's, you don't get restricted from using another. You don't have to pick a primary. We just need to know all of the different ways that you're commuting. Okay. And then this one towards the end of this one, was this yes. just population or is there something else on this that I don't understand? It says like 20 to 40 residents, 40, 41 to 60 residents. Is that just that's, thousands of people or what's that? That's actually, of the work zip codes that we have, those, those are the places that those people are working. They drive, Arlington they drive from residents. Arlington to those places. Oh, this is where Arlington residents are working. Yes. Oh, okay. I could not put that together. Okay, and, um, and then this one, what was this responses? The response rate for that one? But, but like what's, what was, you said, so we have a draft survey, and we've got this thing which is total responses. What's, what's Those this? are from the town census. The this is, uh, census. got yes. it, okay. Yeah, that's from the 2012 town census. And this is again, where, oh, this is where they're working. I have yes, this, now, is, just, this okay. is just the, uh, the destination information of residents within Arlington. Thank you. And that was basically just to give us an idea of are they commuting in the corridors that we think that they are commuting? And they were, but we wanted to make sure, which is something that we would also be gathering again with this new survey. So we would be able to take that and you could also put that with all the previous town census information. Got it, okay, I apologize. I was totally struggling with that. I, it's, a, it's a lot of information jammed into a really small space. It's nicely shown though. Okay. Awesome. You good? Other than I'm colorblind. Um, one more, sorry, uh, sorry, but sometimes no, I'll, I'll die. So Thank you. This one. I'm going to stop backwards because Mr. Dunn kind of segued into it because I was looking at the um, data collected and it was from the 2012 um, town survey. Yes. And if you look at the responses compared to residents in the town, and because perhaps we didn't put a focus on that we were going to really be seeking this information to input into this, I think what I'm hearing from you is that in order to supplement the limited information in terms of number of respondents, um, this is the reason for this draft survey, final survey, that will give us a better um, sort of framework of what Arlington residents, and what I'm saying is when we did the 2012 census, you know, we didn't have the crystal ball to know that you all would be doing this in 2014, yeah. and maybe I might have, as a selectman, really encouraged people, you know, can you make sure you fill out that part, or maybe Vision 2020 did that. But what I think I'm hearing from Mr. Dunn's question is that that's what this draft yeah. survey is going to supplement, complement. It's, yeah, it's very targeted. It's transportation and commuting, mm -hmm. and it's all forms of transportation. Okay. So we're not even just asking about like how your work commute goes. We're also asking recreationally and all of that information and having a full understanding of all their transportation needs, concerns, and also current conditions. That's fine, because I was saying relying on the responses from this, I would be a little nervous, but with the draft survey, and on that, I know I was waving at Steve. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't I'm mean sorry. to interrupt. <laughs> um, I'm not vice chair anymore. I keep forgetting that. Um, I just put these t towards you all, and if anything is redundant, I didn't see it or not appropriate, please feel free. Okay. Um, just in terms of the draft survey, um, what I would like to see, I know we ask about um, renting bikes, Zach's or Hubway. Could we include on, include on the transportation vehicle side um, if they use a zip car? Yes, some of course. Some information around that. Um, and, and if any of my colleagues, you know, for some reason you think I'm going off base, just please tell me. Um, the second thing is, if, if this is something we could do, um, 
just sort of dealing with it in a different way. Could we gather any data on, we talk about how many individuals in your home and sort of the makeup of them and the, you know, race and, and other things. Can we ask how many disabled children slash adults in your home? Can we ask what forms of um, transportation do you use, dial a ride, uh, family friend, contracted service with the state, just to get where, you know, we're trying, you know, encompass everybody. Would that be appropriate? Yeah, I mean, we can definitely add a section on accessibility, and I have to say, it's honestly something that just didn't occur to me at the time we had written it, um, and this is a first draft, but yeah, we can basically do maybe okay. five or six questions all focused on accessibility. Right, because I'd like to get a sense of how many disabled children and adults are out there and how, you know, they're getting... And I don't know you have to define it, work versus school. Whatever, you know, I'd just like to get a sense on that and what transportation that they're using. No, we can definitely do that. And how their responses come out. And I guess what you would do is, um, for certain questions that some people may be like, oh, you're going to use the phraseology open-ended or something like that, whatever, which means, you know, you can skip over that if you want. Yeah, we wouldn't require that. I mean, I think as we go to build the survey, the only required things we would have are probably zip codes. Right. Um, just because we really absolutely have to have those. But anything that um, can be viewed as more sensitive is always optional. Mm -hmm. And I know the Commission on Disability would probably be interested in that. So yeah, and what we can do is we can actually just run it past them, run the set of questions to make sure we didn't miss anything. Okay, and then my last, and it's just my curiosity, and if it's really an undue exercise, um, I would be curious if, I, I know you have in here, when you talk about people, what time do you leave for work, what time do you get home, and you... Um, what time do you pop your work or school to go home and you have after 7.30 p.m.? I'd be kind of interested in, with the um, MBTA increasing um, late night service to different um, forms of the T, that being the L wife. I would be curious if maybe you could add um, what time do you depart for home, maybe add, I don't know what time the service technically starts, maybe, you know, 12 midnight on or something like that. I'd like to get a sense of how many Arlington residents are. And I know the businesses and restaurants, um, you know, that probably would be helpful to them also. How much they're actually utilizing the um, extended hours offered by the T, because the yep. red line is one of the services. And I believe the Route 77 bus is one of the services. It is. Yes. Yeah. It is, yes. Would that be appropriate? Yeah, I think it would be. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, that, that, those would be my, just because you said, and okay. then we'll see the final draft draft when you. Yeah, we'll definitely add something about late night service. And we can also maybe draw that whole section out a little bit. I think that's traditionally kind of the hours that we've asked. But I think dealing with a community that maybe has different um, service industries that might be better to extend that out and really kind of capture as much of the workday as we possibly can. And the, the reason I ask that is like for the businesses, if they see there really is, you know, quite a few people that night that might affect maybe some events that they have, they can say, well, I obviously have um, interest and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I might not be up at 12.31, but <laughs> somebody else might. So and anyways, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. So um, I'm still, I still think there's something weird here okay uh, so the it couldn't be to, it, if you add up drive bike and public transportation it adds up to the number that says total responses so that total responses maps over here to the total residents so either so for instance I, I work in Boston and I drive and I bike and I and I use public transportation the, yes. according to the definition we, we just talked about but I'm getting counted as three people in the residents so when you go to the map, that is, that is just the work zip code. That's not taking into account, let me see how to phrase yeah. this. Basically, they're, they're not repeated. It's not taken in the total. When we're looking at that, we're looking at just that work zip code, and we know individually yeah. who is going to cross the line. This is a very simplified version of those results, but you're not being counted more than once in that work zip code. Okay. That is just to, the page that has the table is just drawing that out to give you a better idea of the top communities. Can you that send people, that along then? Because I confessed it right now, I'm, I need to see it to believe it. Yeah. Um, cool. Yes, I Thank could. You. Yes, I could send you the full data. Thank list. you, I'd, re I'd really like that. Perhaps I can do that. Instead of, you know, if pointing I'm, the map, if we could take this. I'd love to see that. Uh, I can just, yeah, I mean, I can just offline. give you the full extrapolated version of it. I'd love that, thank okay. you. Oh, I, I just had one small question. You, you said it's zip codes that are driving this. I, I'm just wondering if there isn't a transmuted number here. I see Hanson hanging out there away on its, on its lonesome, and I know that it's a small bedroom community, so I'm wondering if maybe it's possible that a digit on a zip code got, got transmuted 
as far as and that's actually representing another community we basically what i'll do is i will go through and just send you excluding the map i will send you just the full data okay and that might make it a little bit easier like that thank you thank you i'm sorry just on that so this would mean nobody in arlington works in worcester for example well it's 20 or over so it's the the, or it's under 20 residents and this is and also your responses to your census were maybe like six thousand people this is not representative. I, you couldn't, sure. We do not have a large enough sample to extrapolate this. Sure. So, I mean, I am positive there are plenty of people who work in many more communities, but just with the data that we were given, that's all we can give you. Great. And just um, sort of housekeeping, um, is this something that, do you all have a really good memory in terms of the questions that I asked that be included? Or is this something I need to communicate with you offline? I, I got it. You got it. Well? I have it. Yeah. Thank you. No, I was. I know what. I wasn't looking for a writing pen over there. I think I'm that's sorry. what he's here for because yeah. he doesn't speak. But he's yeah. <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry. No, I just because I was going to say if you wanted me to forward it, I will. But the town manager. No, I mean I, I do have a really good memory. Oddly, when it comes to surveys, and basically what I'll do is every section basically they brought up, we will just go back through and go through all of them. Beyond right. even the questions that you asked, we will go through and exhaust every possible option. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you, thank you very much. I think, um, you know, I did have some questions, but I think we did cover them all uh, tonight. So thanks for all your hard work on this. Um, I would be interested in seeing the data on the car sharing program before, you know, of course, moving forward with that. I think, uh, but I, I find all this very interesting outside of the box, which is very cool to me. So thank you very much. Oh, and also, if you guys ever have any questions beyond the questions that we will get back to you on, if you let Adam know, we can get that information to you very, very quickly. So if anything kind of comes to your mind, they're like, oh, I'd like to know a little bit more about that, just let us know, and we can put something together. Great. Move receipt Second. and appreciation. Second. Uh, well put. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the report or the window open? Oh, well, yeah, I thanked Adam uh, for the window open. Moving on. Two minutes for technical setup? Here? Yeah, yeah, of course. Good. Can I, yeah, I'm gonna We're going to take a two minute break.
Okay. Um, thank you very much for bearing with us for that little break, everyone. And uh, moving on, uh, we have a presentation of the parking study, uh, Mr. Chaplain. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Byrne. So tonight we're joined by uh, our uh, consultants from Nelson Nygaard to talk about our Arlington Center parking management study. So we're joined by Lisa Jacobson and Ralph Danisco. Uh, they've been working uh, very uh, long and hard with our parking subcommittee, uh, who is made up of a number of people who I believe are listed in the memo, uh, or excuse me, in the actual study that was provided to you. And I know we're here. Uh, Laura's here tonight. Howard's here. Marie served on the committee. I went to some meetings, ones that I couldn't be at. Andrew was at. Uh, so as you all know, uh, there are a lot of issues um, regarding parking in Arlington Center. And I have to say that the, the work that the committee did and uh, that the folks from Nelson Nygaard did was really exhaustive at looking at these issues. Uh, and an incredible amount of public outreach. Uh, they'll talk about the public survey that was done. Uh, a large number of public meetings, one specifically tailored to the business community, which is obviously very important to Arlington Center. Uh, so I think you know, the vast majority of opinions, issues, problems, solutions have been tossed about, have been listened to. Uh, so we're very eager for uh, you to hear uh, the report tonight, to hear about the study, to listen to the recommendations uh, that they're making, uh, and then to get your feedback. Uh, tonight, we are not making final recommendations and asking for the board's action on anything. Uh, we're talking about the draft recommendations. We want to hear your response to those draft recommendations, get your feedback, uh, and then come to you with final recommendations sometime in the next, uh, next month or so and try to implement some of the things that we've talked about. So with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to, Lisa, to Lisa. Good evening. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. Thank you to the Board of Selectmen, to the Town Manager, and to the Town and the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, we have done a lot of work on this parking study. Uh, parking is tricky, it's personal, it's political, um, but we, we tried to make sense of a lot of information and, and distill it down here. So that's what we'll talk about tonight, what our process was for this study, what the goals are for the study, what our key findings are, what, what do we really hear, and then our draft strategies to hear from you all tonight and what you think, are, are we headed in the right direction and what can we tweak and tinker with to make it even stronger. The process, we started back in the fall. Uh, we did a lot of um, data analysis, some real heavy data work, um, looking at the parking supply, the number of parking spaces in Arlington Center, and also the parking demand, how many cars are parked in all of those parking spaces. Uh, we mapped them, we did a lot of this Excel uh, raw data analysis work, and we also looked at the pedestrian connections and some of the multimodal connections, knowing that you don't just come to the, you don't just drive to the center. We have T access, uh, of course, great bike amenities and also pedestrian amenities. To supplement all of that hard data, we uh, talked to a lot of people. We had over a thousand responses for the online survey. That is phenomenal for a community of the size to hear from so many people. We'll go through some of those responses. Uh, we also got several emailed resident comments. And we had uh, in Jan early January an open <coughs> forum uh, just downstairs. We heard from a great cross section of residents, employees, uh, customers, etc. We moved into phase two of the project right after the open forum where we started developing strategies and looking at some best practices and, and forming some, some uh, initial recommendations. We, when we formed those initial recommendations, we had a meeting specifically for the merchant community. We had about 30 or 35 merchants come out early in the morning to hear all about parking for two hours. We had great participation. And then the following week, we had a public meeting again downstairs uh, where we presented these draft strategies and recommendations to hear directly from the public to hear the concerns. After those two meetings, we refined it a little bit and we, we put it into a draft document, which you have here, and, and I'm gonna present a summary of that tonight. How many were at the public meeting? You said there were about 30 businesses mm -hmm. at the That's, business one. Say about, yeah. Third, yeah. About, yeah, about 35 yeah. or so. About the same, yeah. yeah it was, no, great question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, why, are, why are we here? Why are we doing this? The town asked us to really take a deep look at evaluating the parking supply and demand, look at the different user, there's different preferences uh, among different user groups throughout different times of the day and day of week, um, and come up with a suite of alternatives. Just one tinker is not going to solve the parking problem. We need a suite of strategies here. Uh, we went through a, a public process, and of course we want to keep in mind that this should be a financially sustainable type of parking plan. Our goals for the project are many. Uh, first and foremost, providing convenient and available parking for customers and clients. We want the 
the center to be uh, economic, um, have great uh, businesses here. We want the businesses to thrive. Parking is an important piece of that equation. Uh, we also need employees to find parking as they work at these businesses. Um, improving signage, regulations, and information so people it's clear, well communicated, people know where they want to go, where they can be, so they're not scared of getting that ticket. Um, and note of very important here, um, investing in new technology, making it really convenient and easy for people to use. Um, just a, a quick note on the study area. Uh, the white boundary is the initial study area that the town developed and collected uh, inventory and utilization data. We wanted to expand that study area just a bit to really capture not just the heart of the activity, but those few blocks right around it to see any spillover effects in what was going on in those uh, adjacent blocks. And I'm just gonna jump right into oh, really what we found. Um, First, our, our first uh, finding was we went, we spent some time in the field, on the ground, and collected we, all of the parking inventory information. So this is, includes everything in the study area. You can see uh, Mass Ave running through uh, Mystic Street. This is about 1,700 spaces. All of the colors on this map, are, on this map is, are all different regulations. As a, when you're pulling up and you're driving here, it's confusing. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of different little segments and little parking lots, and it can, can be somewhat daunting. But 1,700 spaces are, are what exists today in Arlington Center. Uh, the first key finding is that the current system is, is broken. Um, and it's broken because on Mass Ave today, there's a mix of one and two hour regulations. And what these one and two hour regulations are saying to a customer when they arrive in Arlington Center is saying, Thank you for coming, we'd love to have your business, but please don't stay for more than an hour or two. This is not a very customer friendly policy, especially if we want folks to be able to have lunch and do some window shopping and, and pay their taxes and be on their way. Often not enough time, this one in two hours. Some on-street regulations are not enforced. There's some signs up saying no parking here, but people park all day, every day, and, and those are not enforced. We really wanna clean this up and have what's on the books, what's on the street, and what people do uh, all in sync with each other. There's also some inconsistent signage. Is this uh, from eight to six? Is this three hours? Is this permit parking? It's confusing. And people need to know and feel comfortable when they're leaving their car that they're not gonna get a ticket so, or, it's not, or not get towed. And then the kiosks back in the uh, Russell Commons lot are they're unreliable, they're a bit difficult to use. We've really found that people all across, all the parking studies we've done, most people really don't mind paying a little bit if it's convenient and it's easy and it's fast and it's simple and they can just, just dip their card in. Another key finding are that customers and employees are frustrated with the system. And when we asked people in the online survey, why do you come to Arlington Center? They say, well, it's convenient to my home and I wanna support local business. Great, but when we ask them, why don't you come here more often? They say that parking is inconvenient and that's really why we're here today is to, to really try and get that one off the list. When we ask folks, how long does it take you to find a parking space once you arrive? On average, you're saying about five minutes. Whether it actually takes five minutes or if this is perceived, ugh, it took me five minutes to find a spot, it doesn't really matter. It's saying people are frustrated with the system. It's taking a while to find a parking, parking place. But what they also told us in the survey is that customers, employees, and residents, when they come to Arlington Center, they're actually parking quite close to their destination. Customers and employees, about two out of three are parking within one block of where they want to go. Most importantly, on the online survey, employees reported that about half of them park on the street when they come to work. They park, they're telling us on the survey they're parking on Mass Ave and on Bedford Street, whether they're rubbing the chalk off from their tire or shuffling their car around. Employees, they're telling us, and we've been observing, that they're taking up valuable customer spaces. And to park longer than three hours here, um, you can park for three hours in the Russell Common Lot and the railroad lot, but to park for longer than three hours, you do need a permit in public parking areas. There are a lot of private parking areas, about 30% of the off-street parking is private. It says customer only, it says resident only. This is a lot of opportunity uh, for some longer term uh, parking. The demand here is also unbalanced. The way the regulations are set up, um, there's some, some very high pockets of activity and some lower pockets of activity. The uh, color scale on the bottom left, the green is saying, this is just about where we wanna be. There's some activity here, but we're not too full. Once we get into the pinks and the reds, it's saying, whoa, we have a problem here. And if you look along Mass Ave, all those on-street segments, those are all of our pinks. 
in our greens. This is saying, it is really hard to find a space on Mass Ave. The, most of the lots have a little bit of availability. This is Thursday, by the way, and observed Thursday at one in the afternoon. When we observed the same uh, area on Thursday at 7 p.m., there's actually an event going on at Arlington Catholic that, that, that night to give us a good idea of what happens on an event where there's an, uh, there's an evening when there's an event here, which is often in the back of the Russell Common lot is full. It's nearly impossible to find a parking space on the street. So this is that same data with, um, this is on a Thursday from eight in the morning, really until 8 p.m. The blue bars are the number of cars parked in Arlington Center and the beige uh, are the empty spaces. So throughout the day, in total of, of these about 700 spaces that were counted, uh, the spaces are about 70% full. So there is some capacity here, there's not a ton. When there's an event at night, a little bit less capacity. But when we break that out, looking at the on-street spaces and the off-street spaces, we can see a clear pattern here that there's a lot more availability off street than on street. And I'll, I'll get to the punchline now that the on street spaces are free and the off street spaces, spaces you are paying for them. People are, are clearly self-selecting and circling around to, to get in those free spaces. Uh, in the back of the Russell Commons lot where the permit, permits area are, we want to really recognize that when there are events here, this gets very full. Um, there's, there's no availability in the evening um, and this isn't just for Arlington Catholic, but, but the theater and, and other farmer's market, other events that happen, it gets really full back there. The use of curbside space today is inefficient. We have a limited amount of curbside space. This is your most valuable parking assets. Today we have uh, multiple taxi stands. We've heard throughout the public process that these taxi stands are not well utilized, that taxis often do not pick you up. They're, they're taking their lunch, et cetera. A so great taxis there right there? Sorry? There's three there, right there? Three there. They might be taking passengers, but um, we heard time and time again um, that uh, they were not picking up passengers. And, and I think there's another one or two around the corner. On exactly. Medford, right? right around the corner. Yeah. 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 Four total taxi stands here. Uh, bus, buses are a great thing to have in Arlington Center, but where these buses are laying over, where they're idling at this plaza right up Broadway, probably not the best place for that pedestrian environment and to create some outdoor activity here. And we need to really think about the best uses for this very valuable curbside space. Could it be bike parking? Could it be a parklet? Should it be more vehicular parking? But we really want to think about what's best for local business and, and really think creatively about using this limited curbside space. And the last key finding is our connectivity. Connectivity needs a bit of improvement. Every time somebody parks and gets out of their car, they're a pedestrian. They need to use the sidewalk infrastructure, the crosswalks, and, and be able to get around. Some of the walking connections here certainly need some improvement. After you get out of your car in a lot, often a little bit daunting and not much infrastructure to support you walking around. At night, and this is taken with a flash, uh, it, it's dark. And if you're a restaurant employee, you may not want to park in the back when you're leaving at midnight with a bunch of cash in your pocket. You might want to park on street because the pedestrian connections and the lighting are, are not really supportive. So in, in summary, uh, the current system is broken. We're, we're telling customers to get out of here after a few hours. Uh, customers and employees are generally frustrated with the way the system has, is, is keeping up. It was kind of made for that nine to five employee in Arlington Center has certainly changed. Uh, the demand is unbalanced. There's some areas that are really, really high demand and others that are, have, have smaller uh, activity. The use of curbside space is, is inefficient, and we, we need to really think carefully about that valuable curbside space, and some of our connectivity, particularly our pedestrian connections, could use some improvements. So on to the strategies. So again, our project goals, um, really creating availability for customers, making the system work for the users of the system. And I'm gonna go through these one by one, I'll introduce them first. Um, establishing clear priorities for regulations. Why regulate parking with one or two or four or five hours? Really think about why we're creating these <coughs> regulations and what they are set up to achieve. We recommend flipping the pricing. So right now our on-street, Mass Ave, Medford Street, Broadway parking is free. Our off-street lots cost some money. We recommend uh, really flipping that and making the on-street Parking costs more money than the off-street parking. We also recommend creating additional long-term parking opportunities for part-time employees and full-time employees so you just don't have to buy a permit to be able to stay for the day or stay for more than three hours. 
And the system needs to be supported with smart technology, great information both printed on the street and on the web, um, and, and some good signage. And there's a whole host of supporting elements uh, that I'll walk through uh, as well. Establishing a clear priorities for regulations, the first is adopting a parking availability goal. What we're really trying to achieve here is some available parking spaces on street and in the lots. Not to charge $3 an hour or 50 cents an hour, but having some availability. So we recommend that the town adopts a goal of about one, one empty space for about every seven spaces. That's kind of the, the national average. It's, it's full here, there's stuff going on, but I can still find a parking space. And that would take some evaluation and monitoring. We also recommend that the regulations are set up to achieve town goals, whether it's the uh, upcoming master plan goals, whether it's supporting uh, local businesses, supporting multimodal access, not just parking, and also being fiscally responsible with how the regulations are constructed. Another is adopting a customer first policy, and there's many ways to do this. One is eliminating or extending some of the time limits we have today. Another is having first 15 minutes free. I'm pulling up to Mass Ave, I'm gonna grab a slice of pizza or go to the ATM, not worry about putting money in the meter, but just be able to be quick in and out. Another is having a smart enforcement policy where it's less uh, ticket, 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 and, and just having a one leeway, just one get out of jail free card, just a good customer policy, particularly for, for those folks that aren't familiar with the area, just coming into town once or twice a year. And we're seeing with the, with the enforcement revenue that uh, there's like, $340,000 is coming from meter violations or violation, traffic violations and, and $70,000 $70, coming from parking meter revenue. So a lot more is coming from violations than the actual revenue. If we flip that, folks honestly don't mind paying. They'd rather pay an extra dollar or two rather than risk getting a ticket. I'm sorry, what did first ticket free mean? First ticket free is uh, your first ticket, say, of the calendar year would be free. So if, if you, would be ticket forgiveness. So oh, oh, okay. yep, you, you okay. get a parking ticket, you stayed five minutes later, your first one of the year is just a customer first policy. The second strategy is uh, flipping pricing. So this is a map we, uh, a place to start. Um, and it's, it is quite detailed in a sense, but I'm um, looking for, uh, wanted to explain the general concept of pricing Mass Ave, Broadway, Medford Street, et cetera, um, potentially starting at a dollar an hour to help create that type of availability, really get those employees off the street and into some of the lots, and still keeping the pricing the same it is today, off street at 50 cents an hour. And the variety of uh, side streets around the center have a whole host of regulations, including one and two hour parking, and we're thinking of extending that to four hour parking to allow a little bit of a longer stay. A couple other changes here would be to extend the on-street time limits from one and two hours to four hours, so letting folks have lunch, do, run a couple errands, and then, and then take off. And also for off-street parking, extending that three-hour time limit and making it unlimited so people can pay to stay. Um, and the meter spans as well today. They go from eight to six. We're not seeing a lot of demand at eight in the morning. The, the pricing and the span of enforcement should match demand. There's no reason to price if there's not enough demand. There's no reason to enforce if there's not a lot of demand. So instead of going from eight to six, uh, we're recommending on street going from 10 to eight and off street going from 10 to four. Really after four o'clock, unless there's an event, there's not so much going on off street. And another good incentive for evening employees to park off street because it's free after four. Another strategy is creating additional long-term parking opportunities. There's a lot, there's about 300 spaces here that are privately owned. And there's some potential here to share some of these privately owned parking areas. Some may be during the day, some may be at night, some may be just during events. Um, and we haven't looked into all of the details, but there are some ideas of how to uh, share some of these private parking facilities. And it's been doing, been, it is happening in other communities. Um, we're working with Lexington right now. They have a couple of agree lease agreements with churches, uh, with banks, um, to utilize these underutilized parking spaces, particularly either during the day or at night whenever those parking areas are not being used. Um, updating our, the permit program is a another strategy to help create lo long-term parking opportunities. Um, instead of selling so many permits in the Russell Commons lot, 
uh, with having no time limits there, we expect fewer people will buy permits and more just may pay, especially if they're uh, just a part-time employee. Um, we are allowing, would like to allow longer term parking in some of these off street um, spaces and keeping the current permit price as it is today. And then again, a lot of these spaces, these permit spaces would again be open up for the public uh, after 4 p.m. This system would, would never work without good technology. Technology that's reliable, that's easy to understand, uh, that takes credit cards and coins, um, that is compatible with pay by sell. So if you've parked in the lot, now you can pay with your cell phone, you're sitting at lunch and you get a text saying, hey, your meter's up in 10 minutes, and then you can just extend it on your phone, a really a customer-focused way to, to handle things. Um, of course, we want this to be compatible with the enforcement uh, handhelds, so all the data uh, to monitor and evaluate this program is actually quite easy. It's all through this technology. Uh, to start, we would recommend uh, at the top the single space smart meters. So every parking space does have an individual meter head. Um, really convenient, you don't have to walk, uh, especially when the weather's bad. And then looking at something like a pay by space system in the lot, which means that every space is numbered. If you're parked in the back of the lot, you kind of walk and hit, hit one of these kiosks on your way out, dip your credit card, type in, um, in space 106, and then you're on your way. There's lots of different technology out here. We think this would be a nice place to start. Uh, along with technology, having great signage and information is really important. Signage uh, and information before you arrive. The Arlington Center business community is a really small version of a postcard they've been working on at the top. That could be expanded. It can go online. It could be uh, clickable, so you can click and get more information about each business. It's great information if you haven't been here before or to learn something new. Uh, information for cars, when you are approaching the center, where do I go, where do, where do I enter this lot? So increasing uh, where the signage is placed uh, as a, so you can see it as a driver. And then also once you're out of your car, where do I go, how do I get back to that lot? Uh, having pedestrian scale signage to know what destinations are in town, but also how to get back to those parking areas. And a few supporting elements. Uh, multimodal improvements, uh, really, dovetailing off that, the great presentation from the 128 Business Council. Uh, of course, there's a, there's a lot of cyclists coming through here. There's a lot of people taking the T. You're already working on some great improvements in the center, adding some more bike racks, potentially adding an on-street bike corral. And these pink arrows are uh, indicating where some of those pedestrian improvements uh, would make a really big difference. Um, we also have some recommendations about uh, some of the bus layover on-street areas, how they can be shifted a bit uh, to make um, make that plaza a bit more livable. Another supporting element is overseeing a parking program like this, a smart parking management program. Uh, we feel strongly that the town needs a parking champion, someone that's gonna get really excited about these parking efforts and really lead, particularly in the monitoring, uh, implementation monitoring and evaluation of a program like this. Uh, this could be with a parking management committee comprised not just of town staff, but those that are really bought into a smart uh, parking management system, um, some representatives uh, from the merchant community um, and others. And this committee will report directly to um, the TAC and work with the parking clerk and with you all uh, to really report on how this parking management program could work or, or is working. A few other supporting elements. Um, events are really important here. And that brings in a lot of people. We want those people to have a really good experience. We don't want them to leave Arlington Center and say, I saw a great show, but I got a ticket. Well, we want it to really work for them. So thinking smart about when we have periods of peak demand, where we can use some private lots or, or lease some facilities to, to have that overflow parking. Another is a parking benefit district. Um, many communities are exploring this now. What this means is taking all of the revenues from the parking system putting them potentially into a separate fund, paying the uh, enforcement guys and the, and the meter technology fees and those credit card fees, and using the rest of that money to invest in those types of improvements I was talking about, pedestrian improvements, um, bicycle improvements, uh, restriping, whatever it may be. So really not going into the general fund, but rededicating that money into the center. Again, a lot of shared parking opportunities with some of these private lots, particularly after hours. There's also some opportunities, again, with some, some money in the pot to redesign some of the lots, to slow down cars a little bit in the lots, um, and potentially restripe and, and maximize some of the supply there. 
Um, tr and the last is a transportation demand management program is really what those guys from the 128 Business Council were alluding to. Not everybody drives here, but having really good, solid choices and options for people to get here and potentially even incentive programs. So uh, a, a T pass for town employees or one of the larger businesses in town to really encourage people that there's options here you don't have to drive and, and you can get here other ways. So everything I just spoke very quickly about uh, is on this map, which is also in your packets. And uh, our next steps from here are, are hearing from all of you um, and really trying to finalize this parking management plan uh, and, and eventually get it hopefully adopted for implementation. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. A lot. Thank you very yeah. much for that presentation. That was great. Um, I'm sure we have some comments. Yeah. Um, anyone want to go first? I'll start, yeah, Devin, we'll start the line and go over. So, excellent work. If we did it all, what would it cost? <laughs> that if you did it all, including all the pedestrian improvements Everything that we talked about? Right. And honestly, I don't know the answer to that because we didn't know, cost out some of those pedestrian improvements. The short answer on the technology side is it costs less than you think. Um, because a lot of companies will lease you the equipment as opposed to you purchasing it, and they'll just take a slightly larger cut of what those fees are to do it. There are quite a number of parking technology companies that really want to, you know, they want to give you the equipment and they want to have a long-term relationship with you. I guarantee you that, you know, if there's an article that goes out in the paper that says Arlington looking to purchase new meters, Somebody here is going to start getting calls in the next couple of weeks from these companies. I will so say, I actually already did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the short answer is it, it costs less than you think. I would say that the individual meters that we're suggesting for Mass Ave cost a little bit more because you have to put the poles in and they're all separate equipment. But the reason that the committee is recommending those at this point is that there's so many smaller parking areas that it's a lot harder to, you'll, you'll end up having to put almost as many kiosks out there. So a meter is less expensive than the kiosks, but um, you know the multitude of them that you'd have to put out there would ultimately raise the cost a little bit. I'm amazed at this, be having lunch on my third drink at Trist and my cell, <laughs> my cell phone rings to tell me. I saw you get really no, <laughs> appreciative of that. I, I was referring to Diet Cokes that my cell phone would ring and say, your meter's gonna run out in 10 minutes. That's phenomenal to me, but. So, uh, Lisa, you talked about event parking plans, right? So, you've been there during the farmer's market, have you, right, in the Russell lot, right? And uh, we've gone to allowing permit permits, is that, uh, uh, um, but, or for example, town day, when we have to close streets and stuff. Mm -hmm. w w what does this mean? You know, uh, what does this mean? Change parking regulations for that day to make a better event? Uh... During, during events to accommodate a lot of people, some changes should be made. It can be as simple as some sandwich, talking with a landowner and getting some sandwich boards put outside St. Agnes or whatever other private lots during that particular event time of day and day of week and time of year can be utilized for public parking. Uh, these types of lease agreements really range in variety from, from pretty simple, you know, just during the farmer's market we're going to do this, to a longer term lease agreement, a, a real legal document um, that has, has a lot more detail in it. Uh, but these are happening all over the place. Um, the USPS and, and Verizon and um, agencies that you would never expect would share parking and have public parking after hours, banks, churches, uh, it's happening all over the country and it's a great use of parking assets that exist but are being underutilized. So when the system is really put under a big crunch during the farmer's market or an event at the theater, uh, thinking smartly about expanding the parking supply with really good signage and information, et cetera, uh, would go, would go uh, ways, uh, real ways here. And, and I would add, and it's doing it on a regular basis. So, you know, it, as an example, you know, we have to activate event plan A because there's there's a full you know there, there's a two week run of a show at the theater, and we know it's going to be full for two weeks. So that there's certain lots that we want to open up, and what that really allows you to do is not just that you have that extra availability, but you can do the advertisement for that availability so that it goes out with the notices for that event, right? You know, Corey can set up the signs in advance and tell his folks how to do that. I mean, it's it's 
it's all of those things working together. Makes sense. Uh, I, I just have one more um, because they'll all ask the intelligent questions. When all the time you referred to employees, customers and employees, right? The employees includes business owners, I assume, right? That, that's one category, okay. Correct, the way, way we did that real quick is in all those survey responses, people self-identify at the beginning so we could kind of parse out the information you identified yourself that you shop here, dine here versus that you work, work or own a business. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. You know what, I have about half a dozen questions, so could I defer, because I have a feeling perhaps some of my well, colleagues in the chair, yeah. and then I won't have to, so, I, so I feel ask, like I always get first pass. I didn't ask any of your questions. Oh, I had, I had 15, but now I'm down. <laughs> so I'll defer. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, I've had the good fortune to attend all three of your, your presentations, and, and I think that um, after hearing the concerns that the public and the merchants brought, I think that you've done an excellent job uh, of really um, you know, digesting the situation and incorporating the, the concerns that were, that were brought in here. I mean, some things that I think that, that we've just taken for granted going along is, well, of course, parking regulations are eight to six, but when you step back and really take a look, for so many of the businesses, that those aren't the operating hours, and so many of them are opening at 10. And we, we do have some that are early morning, early morning openers, and we have to take that in, into consideration, but I think just a change like that to, to match the actual use is um, very important. I, I like the demand management approach of making the more valuable parking more expensive and, and, and making it less onerous in the back and giving um, employees and business owners who are here you know, throughout the week a choice now whether they want to participate in the permit program or particularly for part-timers who are only here a couple times a, a week it makes more sense for them to just be able to just pay as they go and there are no time limits. Um, <clears throat> I am wondering how would that system work in those cases where there are, um, you know, em employees, you know, or, or students or, or, or teachers or, or, or others who do get into the center before 10 when the, um, the meters are in effect in the lots. Let's say they wanted to use the lots. Would these systems typically operate where they would have to go back at 10 o'clock to, to, to feed them or they would be able to pre-feed them? And I'm gonna have a follow on regardless of your answer. Mm -hmm. it, it does depend on the meter technology. As we've seen what's out there today, uh, well, technology has improved a lot from what you have today and it does, some technologies do allow for you to, at 8 a.m. you can pay for two hours and that lasts till to noon, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I mean, I, I think that that's important because I'll even, <clears throat> without revealing where, let's just say one of my children takes a class in the center right now at, at uh, one of the establishments, and sometimes I'll go to pick her up and I see the teacher walking down the street, and I'll go, whoa, am I late picking them up? Well, they have to go feed the meter. And, and I think that this, this really um, addresses this um, very well, but I think one of the questions that you're going to get is what is to prevent commuters from coming in and, and just leaving the car all day long and and skipping out of Arlington, especially if we do a great job in the multimodal improvements. And if, if they're paying to stay, if they know that they can pay and, and park here all day and jump on the bus and come into town, go into town and then, and then come back and stop and, and pick up dinner and get back in their car and go home, that, that to us is an acceptable use of the public parking here. Um, yeah, and that's something we'd, I think we'd want to discuss. Yeah, no, the short answer is nothing is okay. to prevent them, okay. except the price. Yeah, sure, sure. And the last thing I would say is, is uh, you know, uh, my, my colleagues are sick of hearing me say this, but I do meet regularly with the merchants in the, in the center, and we kind of did a, um, a post-mortem after the last um, public meeting, and I think one of the concepts that you laid out here that people were very interested in um, was the, um, the parking benefit district. And that's because there's so many great ideas about wayfinding and such that I hear from the merchants, people can't find our business. We even, we approved one. When Ted Fields came in a couple, couple of months ago, he came in with a sign for the Mystic Street Shops. But then finding the sources of funding to actually put those ideas into action is always difficult. And I think that this provides potentially a way to fund some of the wayfinding and the, the business district improvements that benefit those who are using the parking and then feeding the meters, they derive a direct benefit as do, as do the businesses there. So I'd be very interested in finding out more about what the experience has been in other communities uh, around that. Great. Thank you. Do you want to 
It, it, the experience has been very positive. I mean, we spared you examples of other places that have implemented programs like this. We certainly have made those available and can continue to. One of the best things, and you're absolutely right about the parking benefit district, is it also sort of takes the sting away from thinking that you're charging just to raise revenue. You're charging to create availability on the street. And revenue is a byproduct of that. And the more that gets reinvested back in the town center, you know, what communities that have done this have found is it's really been to the benefit of the businesses and the buy-in from the businesses because they have a say in how that money gets reinvested in the center is just, it's just enormous and continues over time. And the things you can spend it on are almost limitless. You, know, you, you certainly spend it on the technology, on the pedestrian improvements, on the signage, on special events, on helping to broker some of those agreements for event management or anything like that. You know, it becomes this, this resource that's available for all the other things you're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. John. Uh, three questions, uh, I guess. One, first is, Le you mentioned Lexington uh, and the work you're doing there. I know you're being paid only once by us and once by them, but at the same time, how much can we learn from what their study is saying? I mean, where are you in that process? and? How much does it apply to? Lexington in particular is, is a funny case, uh, but we're working on these, uh, I don't know, half dozen of, of these parking studies all around the country right now. Um, and begging, borrowing, stealing from other communities certainly happens. Uh, Concord, for example, has a 12 minute free button on their meters. And, and that's something we're working with them on, on upgrading their antiquated meters, uh, saying you gotta keep that 12 minute free button. So learning things from other communities uh, happens all the time and packaging them correctly and in different ways for different communities, uh, it needs to be tailored and work uh, here. Um, Lexington, uh, they have, have more complicated management problems or, or issues and, and challenges, and particularly the shared parking opportunities is something that is, is top of their list. How can we utilize some of these side streets for longer term permit parking, and how can we work with a lot of uh, churches and, and private entities to utilize some of their parking, because they're really seeing a big parking crunch. Okay, and you may have actually just answered my second question, which was, I didn't, uh, uh, the 15 minute free, how, that works by a button, like I'm not, Again, it, it depends. It does depend on the meter technology. But you, you, you had something you recommended up there, so I'm assuming it matches that. On the individual meters, it can work that there's literally a button that you push that gives you the first 15 minutes free. Yeah. So if you're thinking about somebody who really is just stopping and going to the ATM, you don't have to take any money out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can hit that and then start putting your money in and it'll build. So you'll pay for the for, you'll pay a dollar and you'll get an hour and 15 minutes for that. Okay. Dollar. All right. Um, my last one's probably as much comment as it is question, but so under, in your recommendations, you pretty clearly and you emphasize that implementing one strategy without another will not likely have the same impact without implementing together. And I definitely understand why there's a package here that makes sense. And I'll tell you that the first four for me, the clear priorities for regulation, flip pricing, create additional long-term parking, and aid system with technology signage information, um, I'm pretty, the, you've made a very compelling case for all four of those. And so I had, now the, the supporting elements is where they're less defined and frankly I get a little bit, um, I'm not as convinced on uh, some of them. And, and so I'm very curious, I guess probably I just want to defer this maybe for your, for your next report, but how many of those supporting elements really are key and um, in, in, in what ways? So like event plan, totally buy that one. Uh, it's funny that you brought it up, Joe, but the, um, the parking benefit district is one that I actually am, am, I'm struggling with. And part of it is because I have a hard time mapping what the, because one of the recommendations in particular, you emphasized more in March than you did today, and maybe that's because it went away, or maybe it just hasn't come through, was you said we're gonna change the price, we should change the price on our parking such that we get to our goal, which is one out of seven. And if we're changing the price on our parking, then we don't know how much our revenue is gonna be. And if we don't know how much our revenue is gonna be, we don't know whether or not the parking district how much it can pay for itself. So there's part, so maybe it's I just need to know more about it. So I'm, you don't have to answer this now, but I'm curious how many of the supporting elements you really think are make and break in this package that what you're talking about. And it, it, it's a really good question because the, there's a, we can do 40 slides on any one of these individual mm -hmm. things. I, I think one of the important things to think about is that the supporting elements especially can be implemented over time, right? I think it would be absolutely 
responsible of the town if you said we like the idea of the parking benefit district and it's going to be revenues over a certain point or you know after we've paid for the new technology and the new investment that we've made that when there is spill you know when there's spillover dollars that those could become available i think th those sorts of questions are absolutely things that, that you should be thinking of. the governance structure is the same thing the first thing you should do is not the governance structure the first thing you should do is really start digging in on the first four recommendations that we talked about but over time how do you manage that you want to get past the point where this group has to meet every time you want to change a parking sign or you want to raise the rate to a dollar ten or something like that you want the committee to be able to have those conversations and not have to do that here so those are things that you sort of build transportation demand management is another one you're working with the 128 business council in the longer term that's absolutely the kind of thing you want to get to you want to and one of the ways to get additional parking is to get less people to drive and more people to do something else so that's those are things you want to work on over time the lot redesigns again uh, some of the multimodal improvements I think it's helpful to prioritize them you're already working to improve the main intersection here in the center that's something that's going to happen soon I think and 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 we all collectively think some of the pathways to the garages especially to the Russell Commons lot from from Medford Street absolutely should be one of the first things you do does that mean you can build it tomorrow no but you can start identifying what those improvements will look like and what the funds are for that okay right, so the, I mean so these things they're all supportive they're not they're very helpful and they'll build over time but I would think about those in those ways thank you I'll say thank, thank you thanks I still have like six so why don't I'm hoping someone takes them off <laughs> sorry um, well, you know, I think that I share a lot of the same concerns as my colleagues. Um, one have, I didn't hear it throughout the study, was dedicated employee parking. When we're talking about dedicated spots, is that something that, you know, you promote or you're against, or what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on it? So today we have dedicated permit employee parking in the back of the Russell Commons lot. Mm -hmm. We recommend that having employee parking, and dedicated employee parking in the back of the lot continues to make sense. What we expect is that the number of permits in that area needed in the lot would be able to shrink and kind of shift and keep it to the back. Where, But in the front of the lot, in the entire lot, any employee could purchase a, a you know, a pass, a ticket for the day, uh, pay to stay for the day at 50 cents an hour or whatever it is in the end uh, to be able to park uh, when they are there. So keeping some dedicated employee parking certainly makes sense. Monitoring it over time and, and seeing what happens would be a good idea, but we think keeping that permit program in place for now. Is now, good. but did you, and correct me if I'm wrong, did you mention that a lot of the employees tend to park on the street? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would we go about reversing that to get them to go into the permit. Yeah, there, there's a couple of ways. Uh, first, um, just increasing a price on street that is more expensive than the off street parking is a huge motivator. If someone's coming here five days a week or even four days a week, a part time employee, that a dollar an hour versus a 50 cents an hour on the lot it really adds up over time. People are going to do that math and figure out and self select where they should be going. Um, employees right now, unless they buy a permit, they can't park in the Russell Common Lot because it's only three hour parking and it costs them money. So that's why they're parking on street and, and doing the shuffle and, and doing whatever they do. So um, adding pricing on Mass Ave, evaluating this data, I mean, I'm already getting excited about uh, thinking about the data that it's going to really see the impact because I, I really do think you're going to see an immediate change in increase of available spaces on Mass Ave. It's going to be a huge motivator for employees to self-select, get off the streets uh, and into some of these lots. Oh, thank you. Um, the other thing about the parking lot is when we're talking about firms as well, um, Arlington Catholic comes into the conversation, of course, and um, I, I've, I didn't actually go to Arlington Catholic, but I, I, we have a really good relationship them with the town, and I, I don't want to. I think that, you know, they could use that whole lot if we let them, and uh, we don't. But I don't want to see spots taken away from the school. Um, I think that the students really need them, and I would argue that the neighborhoods surrounding the school would agree with that because if you drive down there in the morning say 
you know, all around regardless. Um, you know, and that's just a personal feeling. If there's data, you know, show me otherwise, I could, I may potentially reconsider, but that's on the front of this. That's kind of my initial gut reaction. Um, and that being said, I, um, the only other thing, I wouldn't, I guess the other thing is that with the actual, if we do tend to go through with meters, um, I really hope that they're not just ones that pay quarters. Um, <laughs> fishing around for quarters is, I feel like I've spent days off my life doing that in my car, so I would appreciate um, going for a different route. No, all meters should take credit cards and not the meter cards that you have to sell specially. Mm. Have them take the credit cards, it's so much easier. It's the convenience factors which drives people crazy, just as you're saying. Yeah. In plenty of places, they're charging way more than a dollar, and people are happily paying because they don't have to find 12 quarters. You just put your card in, and, mm -hmm. and, and you're able to do that. If I can, for a moment, just address your question about Arlington Catholic. Yeah, or please do. We did talk to the folks at Arlington Catholic. Mm -hmm. I believe they buy 50 permits today mm -hmm. uh, from the town. 90 permits. 90? 90. 90. I'm going to trust Marie over mm. anybody else. I trust her <laughs> on just about everything, so I recommend it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're not recommending completely eliminating the permit program, because there are others that are like that. But for some of those folks, and, some, and you, know, you may have other people, students even, that are purchasing those permits, if you think about the choice that you make, once you've purchased a permit, you have this feeling that I've already invested in this space for the month. And now I'm going to drive every day because I've already done that. By making those choices visible, if some of those people some days don't drive but take their bike or carpool or do something else, now you're freeing those spaces up for somebody else to use. And one of, one of the things we're typically saying across all modes is you want to make the, the cost of your choice visible to the person who's making that choice. So if every day I have to spend two or three dollars to do it, even if it adds up to fifty dollars a month, which is what the permit costs, but I'm making that choice every day instead of once a month, there are going to be days where I don't do that, right? So that's part of it. So you want to have that opportunity for some of those folks. And I guarantee you, some people will not buy the permit and they'll drive three days a week or four days a week instead of five days a week. Do you think that conversely more people knowing that they don't have a permit and can risk it would go and try to get there earlier and then cause more individuals to come in? No, I mean, it's, it's, you'll still have the whole system. You'll still need enforcement to back up the rules that you set in place. One of the things that'll happen is the rules will be a lot clearer. If you look at the regulations, you saw some of the signs that are out there, and actually I think there are worse ones mm -hmm. um, here in Arlington Center. It's very much a stick approach right now. And what the whole program is really recommending is to switch to more of a carrot approach. Mm -hmm. You want to clearly show people, here's what you can do, here's where you can park. It's going to cost you, but here, and by the way, there's going to be free spaces that are a couple of blocks further away, whether they're on some of the other streets or they're in private lots that we've been able to make some agreement on. So you'll actually open up more spaces so people who even don't want to pay at all will have a place to go. Right now, there's very few places where you can go. Mm -hmm. So. The people that are here every day have figured out how to game the system. They know when Corey's people are out there. They know what time he does his shifts. You know, they're, they're moving their cars around. What you want to do is find a situation where here's where you can park. I'm telling you, I want you to park in this place. It's going to cost you this or it's going to cost you nothing over here. And you can stay here for two hours, for four hours, for eight hours, and you'll be fine. Right? You still need enforcement to back that up. You still need to make sure it's happening appropriately. You still need to enforce public safety violations but you want the whole system working together. That's really what we mean when we talk about the supporting elements, you were right on those four things. If all we did was price mass ebb and didn't do anything else, we're not accomplishing as much as we think we would. You need all of those other pieces in place. Thank you. And if you don't mind, can I just, one thing comment, and I did go to Arlington Catholic, <laughs> but what I have always felt is that they should not have those first spaces as you enter the lot. I feel, you know, those to me, they're kids, let them walk, you know. Uh, I certainly didn't drive to school or have a parking space uh, when I was in school walking barefoot <laughs> through the snow, you know. With the uh, stone tablets. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> But you know what I mean, it, it's moved those spaces down and away, and if we improve the entrance there, it's the closest to the region theater, although that's not often affected by the school day, I recognize that. 
but the people coming in and wanting to walk up to the center, that's the closest point in the center. Uh, and and I'm, I just can't help but my father sat here and they discussed, do you know the apartment houses along the back of the Russell Common lot? Mm -hmm. The yep. town Great almost house. bought those and tore them down so that they could build stores facing this way to the Russell Common mm -hmm. lot. And I can't help thinking today how things would be so different. Because it is, uh, uh, visitors to town, it's a maze to find their way into that parking that's lot. That's your gateway. To, and I live in Medford, I come in all the time. Yeah. And that's yeah. the gateway and that's the first thing you see. Yeah. But I, I, I think they should have the permits. I just wish we'd move them, let them walk a little bit instead of you know others who want to shop and stuff. Sorry, Diane. That's okay. How many of your questions have been asked? I've added two. <laughs> um, well, the first one, which I think will help us because of our, and um, I just want to make sure it's my understanding that, you know, you're coming here tonight, we're not adopting or approving everything, carte blanche, soup to nuts that, of what's before us, because I do have some questions, uh, comments, and concerns, and I think three of them um, also, through the chair, would uh, also involve the town manager. So. I think what you're going to ask us tonight is to receive this and say, God bless, go forth, continue, but come back. So, I'm sorry. And in the spirit of that, if I could just sort of just pose these questions and concerns to you all, um, if there's something real quick and you're like, oh, that's, that's an easy answer, I can give it to you, but recognizing we're going to be meeting again, that's fine. Um, oh Lord. Uh, okay. Um, just to put it on the table in terms of uh, the parking meters of the pay stations, um, just knowing what's down in the municipal lot now, um, in terms of disabled seniors or any other um, issue to take into concern around that. I know when I go down the municipal parking lot, I'm still too short at five, six. On three of them, I have to get up on the curb, as well as I know individuals in wheelchairs. And I know you're going to address that um, and, and provide options on that. The um, other thing is the private lots that you were talking about going out to Verizon and others like that. Am I to understand that the town, through its parking revenues, would pay that, a partnership with businesses? It can work both ways. So the town could help broker agreements to open up more more public parking. The town could, could aid and help give examples that we're happy to provide to say, uh, here you go bank and here you go restaurant. You guys should talk and, and see if you can share some parking in the evening or, or during the day or, or what have you. So can work it in a few different ways. Because I would lean more towards the special event parking that the businesses that will um, benefit from it versus the town taking on a majority of the cost. The other thing that you can define in the future because I see possibly some either competing interests or um, who makes the cut and who doesn't, defining the event criteria in terms of what event is it. I don't want a business to say, you know what, that thing's traditionally just for two or three different uses and it's not for you know, a restaurant that's now staying open till one or something like that. As well as, and I know you have that group of individuals that um, and perhaps that you proposed in terms of for from the business community, maybe that's what they also um, define a criteria when there's competing interests. Um, you know, because hopefully the success of this will create issues like that. And you know, how, how do we address that? Um, and I'll just leave that with you. Um, one of the things that I got concerned about, and I would also, um, through the chair, um, also leave this with the town manager. What I gleaned from your presentation um, when you showed the three taxi cabs on Mass Ave was that you ne may not think that that's a good use of space and to redefine it, which means the taxi cabs would probably go into the municipal lot. I have great concerns with that. I would like an opinion from the police department, from the police chief, and I'll tell you what my concern is. Number one, we're encouraging events that go beyond midnight, um, as well as we have that ill-placed bus stop there. Um, <coughs> But my concern is I'm coming out of Madrona Tree or whatever, I'm coming out of the region at 1 o'clock, and you pointed out in your pedestrian connectivity and lighting, if you're telling me that I have to walk at 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning down that long dock driveway to try to find a cab, when I'm coming out of businesses, I mean, if, maybe if you're coming out of the region, it's not as scary because you're closer to it, but I don't want, to th I don't want this study to be defined. I don't want any, I wanted to make sure it's everywhere and we're talking Broadway Plaza and we're talking all the restaurants that are there and we're talking further down. So I am not in favor of, um, and that's just me, one opinion. I just want to tell you why I'm not and I would be interested in what the. Um, sorry, if uh, you don't mind me. Um, 
You're mentioning Broadway Plaza. That's out of the scope of the study, though. Oh, no. I mean, people who might be, for some reason, staying late at Broadway Plaza and at 12.30, they're coming looking to get a, a cab. Okay. Whether they're coming out of the, I don't know, the restaurants, Fusion Chase. Okay, yep. You know what I mean? I'd you just, do you think that just the lighting aspect of the project would, set, would fix that, that we spoke about earlier? No, only because I know, you know, I, I've taken that long walk. This, unless there was something in the plan that redesigned that entrance into the municipal parking lot, because you can put lights down there like crazy, but there's still an awful lot of setbacks and with the apartments on the left, and you really, I'm just thinking of myself as a woman coming out of a restaurant at one o'clock in the morning. I'm not gonna feel safe down. So, so I just wanna put that before you as well as if the police chief had any. But, but, and I, on oh. that, but you're not recommending we remove all taxi stands, are you? Yeah. We, if there's, there's a lot of detail actually even in the report that looks at it. So we're recommending moving some of the bus layovers and removing the taxi stands that are on Medford Street and on Mass Ave and allowing the taxis to wait, just as you said, in the municipal lot. And that's based on what we've heard and we've asked this has been an issue that's come up throughout this effort, and we've asked everyone that we've seen about this issue, and I'm, I'm definitely open to, to hearing other opinions. I just don't think that's... No, 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 the issue, the issue is this. We haven't heard that anybody walks up to the taxi and gets into the taxi in the taxi stands. That I may have. happen. That may happen. I've seen it. I've been there. But that's, yeah. and that I know asked, someone's saying no, but I understand that some people want those parking spaces on Mass Ave for one use, but we have to think of, you know, we do have right. taxi cabs. We do have to make them available, and especially where we're encouraging businesses to stay later and later open at night so they can make a profit, we I, have to make sure, and, and where the tea is staying open later. Yeah. So that's, I'm just, I don't want to get into a debate, and I know I can see Leland's really getting, <laughs> but I have to, you know, I have to represent a view and a viewpoint. Um, the other thing is I was concerned, and again, for the town manager, um, I'd like to see an evaluation when we were talking about, and I'm just going to use my verbiage and I apologize, um, flipping the fines versus fee for parking. Um, I do know that at town meeting a couple of years ago, I believe is one of the successful candidates on the school committee, but I don't want to quote that individual. Town meeting had a very spirited discussion about increasing our traffic enforcement unit, and one of the caveats was that it was show, also increasing revenues in terms of parking down there. And one of the, um, I think, highlights or benefits that were sold to town meeting and they adopted was that the um, traffic enforcement officers, because of the violations and parking enforcement that they would perform, not only pay for the job, but the town would get double, if not more, back in revenue. So my question to you would be that if we did adopt that, let's flip it the other way, what does that mean in terms of the employment? You know, are we going to have to, you know, decrease the traffic enforcement unit? And I'd like to know that in advance, um, and or if there was some other plan in place. Because before, you know, I know it may only be one or two people, but you know, when that's your job, that's like really important. So I'd like to see whatever you think on that. And I don't mean to not let you talk. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just because it's late, and I know everybody's. So we'll, we'll of course we'll do that evaluation. But I think to the concept that. Uh, Lisa and Ralph were talking about is you'd rather have a thousand people pay a dollar than a hundred people pay a ten dollar fine because they'll be happy paying that dollar to park but a hundred people will be very unhappy paying a ten dollar fine so that that is the strategy not to put words in your mouth but I think that's kind of the, the concept of, of flipping it um, that was quick math um, but uh, I think the bigger issue is if you look at the, the larger scope of what they're talking about and having specific four-hour free parking in the neighborhoods, there's still going to be a great deal of need for parking enforcement officers. The need just might be focused in different areas. And They'll I just get that more concrete. That's ab absolutely. All. Because absolutely. honestly, one of the selling points at town meeting was that it cost, mm -hmm. I can't remember, 40000 to for this person, but he or she's going to generate ninety to 110 under this that's before us, I know you're saying that. I just want to preclude possibly laying anybody off. Okay. So um, the other thing is I just want to put before, when you were talking about lot redesigns, um, many, many years ago when I first got on the board, Dave Walkinshaw was Chamber of Commerce President, Bill Rowe and a couple of the other businesses. In terms of trying to look to increase parking down there, we had um, begun to investigate and found that because there was a historic battle down there, Samuel Whittemore, 
I think he came out of the tavern and he killed seven people and some, and then he was killed or whatever. I had done some investigation and Senator Haven also um, was beginning the framework to get the state under a federal historic matching grant program that basically um, on the municipal lot, so I just would put it before you all since you're doing this as well as you're in Lexington, and I'm on the Lexington list as we all are and following that, and I know there's some creative strategies there. Um, I, and it would deal with working with our legislators to apply to that program again and, and get the matching funds, but it was at the point for plans, but because there was a historic um, event there, we could apply for these federal historic funds, and basically what it did was where the municipal lot goes down as you get to Chestnut Manor, it created a green space, it cr basically created a two-level garage, sure. and it created a green space on the top that you would put the Samuel Whittemore Memorial, mm -hmm. and then you have the regular, so that was a little raise, then you had the street parking that was there, and then you could put another level below, and everything fit. So I would just put that before you all in terms of thinking about, you know, because I was hearing there's no other way, and maybe I'm mishearing to increase parking, that still may be doable, and it's similar to what they do in Lexington. So if you could just look into that. And then my last thing would, would just be to um, the town manager, and I'm sure I, I want to applaud him on, um, you've begun on uh, snow emergencies, implementing a trial program in terms of um, people can park in the Russell Common lot. I would just leave it to you in terms of whatever plans you have in the future. Um, to continue, expand, or whatever, and, and just to make sure whatever we do and whatever policies we put in place, that that still allows you that opportunity to do that. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Sorry. Kevin. So, uh, well, just a couple of things have come up, but I'm curious about um, your thoughts. We make all changes in Arlington Center, and you have certainly convinced me we should. What does that mean for the rest of Arlington? In other words, don't we have to do this from the east to the heights? Uh, there, there may be other areas that you would want to consider a similar approach. One of the benefits you have in Arlington Center is you do have the two municipal lots. They're large, so it gives you a little more flexibility in, in how, you, how you manage parking here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tell you, I just love this, the first 15 minutes free versus mm designating 15 minute spaces that nobody pays any attention to. Yeah. Uh, and, and we removed meters to try to increase business in the center, to try and help people come to the center and park and go into restaurants and, and stores and stuff. And now we're talking about putting meters back in, which I agree with, I think, by the way, especially with modern technology, which will have the same effect. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? The, the idea of that flipping the long term into the Russell and the on street, I don't know, it's just, there's a lot of stuff to think about here. But I have no idea how to get started. One, one thing we haven't said uh, through this presentation, but we often say, is that parking problems are a sign of health. Right? If you have a parking, there's too many people that want to be here, there's enough activity, you, know, you took the meters out at some point because you were trying to generate more activity, you've been successful, yeah. and now you're trying to manage that. And that's what, you know, the, the pricing to create availability will help you with that. And to what degree do you think that's because of the leadership of this? <laughs> thousand percent. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I, like I was brief, and I was brief with nine questions, Mr. Griffin. I'm done. Mr. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Sorry. Thank you. I just thought of one more thing. There, there was one issue that, that came up in some of the public meetings that I, I did not see addressed here. Maybe it was here. Loading zones. And I, and I didn't know if you had thoughts thoughts on that. Um, it was specifically raised that, um, that <laughs> some of the taxi stands and yeah. bus stops are being used as unofficial loading zones, uh, whether there were thoughts about how to approach that problem. And they do operate that way, and, and even moving some of the bus stops, as we're showing, you know, theoretically that, that helps because it's, it's space that's empty. I wouldn't say that you should load there, but it, it definitely happens. Um, the plan that we have doesn't specifically address loading zones, but there's another level that you have to get to when you're looking at block by block how you implement this, and how you lay out the meters. Yeah. And, and I know there were a couple of places that were identified as hotspots, and I think we'd want to look at those a little bit closer. Because I know I've been to some communities where parking is restricted during a set time period yeah. or loading specifically. Often the best way to deal with loading is to, you know, for example, 
allow that loading to happen, let's say before 10 a.m., so before those meters actually turn on, and you can designate a few spaces for that. It doesn't always work with the individual businesses. Different businesses have yeah. different levels of control about when they're able to take their, their deliveries because yeah. it's, not, it's not just specific to them. Sure. The trucks are running certain routes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, move receipt. Second. Second. Thank you very much for all your work, and um, we'll be seeing you again. Thank you. All those in favor? Sorry. Aye. 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 Opposed? Five nothing. Right. Okay, moving on. Well, <laughs> I'm just You tired. don't want to move on? What's I, up, I, Mr. Grilly? Well, I'm, I'm wondering what we're going to do next. It would just kind of drop this completely. No, they, co no, the, they, come, they back. come back. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, all right. That's okay. what I was saying. You're going to come back again. It's not a cop launch approval. All right. Yeah. And I'd like to hear from Howard no, next time. Mm -hmm. Next time. <laughs> Yeah, about TAC and the role TAC might play. We'll talk, Howard. Uh, moving on, uh, future Board of Selectmen meetings. I guess we should say first of all we do have one four fourteen scheduled, and uh, next week is that the next last? Week, is that yeah. the last? Do we have a later one in April or no? No, we, next one's no. the twenty eighth, which is time, town meeting. The twenty first yes. is Patriots Day. Right. The twenty eighth we have to cancel because the selectmen invited to the house. So we don't really. Yeah. So I think we're inside, invited to what? To the Japanese. It will be a celebration. Japanese celebration mm -hmm. before town meeting. Oh. So if we can, but if we need to meet that night because of, for any reason, but we'd, we'd rather, if we can, not meet before that, that first be town meeting. So we have to probably at least do the fifth, unless that's a big no-no. Yeah, I can't do the fifth, but that doesn't make it a big no-no for the rest of you. But I, I'm worried to wait from the 414 all the way to the fifth before a meeting. But we have no, 21st is a holiday, you can't meet, 28th is town meeting. So the first time we can meet is May 5th. Mm. So we have to do the 30th yeah, before town meeting. Yeah, we could do that. We could do the 30th before town meeting. Well, I'll be here. The 30th? Sure. Uh, April th it's Wednesday, April 30th, because we'll be there for town meeting. We yeah, could, but, OK. I mean, I'm definitely open to doing that, but I'm just saying that's yeah. just another hour. Yeah. We'll start with the 5th. I, April 30th. That's true. Well, so May 5th would that's only be an hour, too, right? True. Unless we met at 6 o'clock on the 30th. But again, if you all want to do the 5th, it's just I can't. Yeah, but I'm, I'm fine with doing the 5th. and Just the 5th, not the 30th? Um, I don't think we'd need both of you. Okay. So here's the, well, I'm just saying, talking, thinking out loud, I haven't, um, if we have anything that we need to vote at the last minute before, before town meeting, um, I guess the answer. So I guess the answer is we. Maybe with the answer is we do the fifth, but Mr. Chairman, you may need to call like the something. We'll call yeah. a meeting. Yeah. Pending what's yeah. going on. Right. I am fine with that. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me. You're always in session during town meeting, so that if you had to vote on something Monday or Wednesday night, you have that. It's been posted. Yeah. That you can conduct. Well, that's only if we have to take a vote on something that comes up on town meeting floor. If it's Board of Selectmen business, that doesn't, co yeah. as you know, it doesn't cover that. So we that, may, so keep the 30th as a holder and let the chairman, then, okay. his, his discretion. Can, can I also just suggest that as a calendar, you may want to calendar it in advance what you'd have to do for posting for open meeting in terms of right. holding the 30th. Yeah. So if so we, what, so. what, why don't we just schedule a meeting on the 30th then? For an hour, okay. and, yeah, and you can I think that's the best way. And yeah. then seven. we'll cancel if yeah. need be. Okay. Seven o'clock on the thirtieth. And the fifth at seven. Okay. So that's the thirtieth. So now we're in May. Um, the. Could do this the twelfth and nineteenth. Good by me. That will let Kevin be there and then have the two meetings in May as well. Mm 
I'm sorry, so what day is it again? The 12th and the 19th. Okay. 5th, 12th, 19th. Yeah. I, I don't have one on the 5th. Oh, you don't, don't have one on the 5th. Okay. No. And of course, we'll be done by town meeting then. <laughs> Trying. <coughs> okay, so the 19th and then. I'll place my money that the 19th is our last night of town meeting. It's my, really? That's where I'm putting my. So the 19th and then in June is when we get into one meeting per month? Uh, no, I think that's July and August. July. We do okay. two in June normally. But we do go to casual dress, Mr. Chairman, with your permission. Well, everyone but you. <laughs> really? <laughs> Second. Casual. Second. Uh, Can I take my vote back? <laughs> yeah, no. Too late? Too late. Yeah. So, okay. so for June, for June um, does the, I can't do the 16th. And I would rather avoid the second. So the How about nine and 23? I don't think so. That, that, that works for me if it works for. Die? Nine. Joe? It's fine. Nine and 23rd? It's fine. Yeah. And then July we go to one. May I be casual that month, Mr. Chairman? You may. Thank you, sir. So July, I'm out, I'm unavailable on the seventh and the fourteenth. Unavailable? I am unavailable on the seventh and the fourteenth. How about the twenty-first for everyone? Steve, um, Donnie, one Joe. Second. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't planned my my, my summer um, vacation, so. I usually go away the third week in July, but that it shouldn't rise or fall by me. Then what about the twentieth? I think that we can that be okay? flexible. Twentieth. The twenty-eighth. Oh, twenty-eighth. Does that work for everyone? Okay. Thank you. As, as far as I know, yeah. If, you, if we end up having to move that to the 7th to 14th, yeah. just in the same sense with, as Diane can't, can't do the 21st, yeah. Yeah. you know. Sorry, I haven't even been looking up that I, way. We, I'd tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just speak up if you have any issues. And um, then how about the 25th of August? To just no, to space um, them out about. Not good? I am. Um, I'll actually be away. How about the 18th? That week. I'll be yes. away for that, but Andrew can be here in my stead. So it, no. it might be worth having Andrew come in for a Monday in August. I think we keep on his toes. Could I just ask the town yeah. manager, um, do you have anything planned July, August, of when we do those meetings that I just so love, um, or we, don't, we, we can forego those this year? When we talk about board and goal setting, um, no, we're gonna we'll, we'll need to we'll need to pick a goal we'll setting. setting. Yeah. And yeah. traditionally, yeah. the July or the August meeting, if possible, has been that goal setting meeting. So, I was just asking you. We, we've done we've done an extra meeting. Yeah, we, we've done a, a Saturday morning. I don't in like in Shut June, up! I'm trying to get I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so, okay. All right. Well, then I'll I'll leave it. I don't know if you want to talk about that now in terms of getting our skin, but or we can, if you we want to work. Yeah. Why don't we pick an August and then pick a, a June Saturday? Yeah. That, okay. So, so did, did we say August? the 18th of August? Sounds good to me. Does that work for everyone? Yeah. Not for Adam, I thought. No, not for it's Adam. It's not. But I, I don't do it on my. Uh, well, do, I don't know if we want to go a whole month without seeing you, Adam. <laughs> what about well. the 11th? <laughs> It's just awfully soon after the July meeting. Yeah. Okay, 18th yeah. it is. Okay. Marie, are you traveling with the boyfriend at all this summer? Well, then How are you on these? <laughs> the goals, right? Saturday. So, yeah, what do we think about a Saturday for the goals? Uh, let's in, I think in August? August. Uh, in, Ju in June. Do you, you want to do a Saturday in June for the thing image so we go back to our June calendars? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Is it June normally we do that? I think we did it in June yeah, the past two years, June. yeah. Okay. Well, we might have done it in August last year, but I think June the first year. What's best for you in terms of getting I think getting it done in June, June is probably her. Okay, better. so we're looking at a June and Saturday. Can we do it in the morning and accelerate yeah. it so we're done by yeah. Yeah, like 11. Eight, 8 to 11? Yeah. Um, the, no, yeah. yeah, without a doubt in Just because I'll have babysitting. Yeah, yeah I, I am completely on board. Um, the 21st or 28th work for me. I prefer the 28th of those. Okay, the 28th? Yep. Well, I have my golf league on Saturday, but to sit and talk about Adam's goals and objectives. <laughs> you pass up any time. That is, that is shooting birdies for me. You know? <laughs> and what time, Mr. Chairman? The 28th, um, I'll say. Do, do you want to, I think we need four hours. 
Is that what it was? What did, you, did you say? 8 to 11? And then if we have 11? to go a little later. Say 8 to 11 and see how we do. Go yeah, we have to go past 11. We're going to work on efficiency, so we yes. will. That'll be goal number one. So eight, we'll try to do 10.30. We will score you on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're good to go on that? Thanks for bringing that up, Di. Mm. Much as I. Thank you for bringing that well, up. Well, you know what? I, don't, I can't get it sprung last so minute. Do we, don't, know, we, don't, we, think a, we don't take a vote on that. Uh, you're right. Okay. Uh, moving on. Correspondence received. Uh, Lorelei Collegue. Uh Issues regarding Brightview and Bill Walsh to honor Johnny Kelly. Move receipt. And Move receipt. And um, I did um, speak with on the uh, correspondence from Lorelei Kegel. I Collegue. Yeah. Collegue. Um I did um, speak with. Um, Rick Gallagher um, concerning some of her, if I'm remembering this right, does this have to do with the bright view in, her, in the skyline and I think she has concerns in there saying things have been going well because the town has been a partner in it and she was concerned about what recourse she and her, her neighbors would have afterwards. I did speak briefly and forward it to Rick Gallagher um, but I didn't ask for an official response or anything like that. I would ask yep. the town manager if the, uh, the, the email, I believe, was originally sent to Rick as well. So Rick, Rick, Rick's fully aware of it, working with Lorelei. Uh, a number of these issues were bo uh, brought before the ARB last week. Right. So they're being dealt with. Not all of them can be dealt with, but uh, they're I being dealt with I only re it possible. because he gets so many and he wasn't required. Right. And as soon as yeah. he saw it, he saw that. So there will be an answer to that. I'm anticipating what my question would be is that when um, th the project does close out, close out, does that mean no longer Rick Gallagher? Oh, absolutely. A, yeah. I mean, he's... He's just, I've heard such great things about him. Oh, he's been phenomenal, but Dominic I think the town everybody. can't support okay. a liaison oh, in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. um, on so the I, second one, the Boston Marathon, I thought it was a great idea, but I also didn't know, I didn't have, I didn't have any inspiration about how to implement the idea. So I don't know if anyone else on the board does, or if there's a place to refer that to that would make sense. Memorials. Memorials. You think so? Yeah. Do, do, they, do they deal with free form requests like this one, do you think? Um, better than any other committee. That's and if they want to say no. Um, okay, we can readdress it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So sorry. Uh, I was just cause, so just for people, anyone else who might have a thought, um, Billy Walsh suggested that we honor Johnny Kelly of the Boston uh, Marathon fame, and maybe there's a square or a track or something that we should name after him. And I think that that's a great idea, but I also didn't know what to implement. So I'd ver personally very much welcome any other input that we have. And I um, take the chairman's suggestion and refer it to the Public Memorial Committee, please. Second. And I, I would just like to say that, um, <clears throat> you know, Johnny Kelly, after he lived in, <clears throat> you know, he grew up in Arlington, but in later years he moved down to my wife's hometown of Dennis. They have a huge park named after him down there. So I think it is fitting that we <laughs> uh, acknowledge him in some way. Where did he live in Arlington, do you know? I don't know where. I want to say near Medford Street, wasn't it? Good question. Um, yeah, we'll find out. We'll find that Good out. Good question. Yeah, that's Good question. And, and could I just, um, through the chair, ask Mrs. Kropelka, um, I believe the Arlington Town Day Road Race is not Arlington Town Day. Is it the Boys and Girls Club? Who, who runs that event? Uh, Dr. Park, Park and Rec. Park and Rec. Okay, so it does fall under that. So we would coordinate with them just so that they're aware. And thank you. Okay. But I, I, I'm sorry, I want to go back to the previous one just for a second to Adam, based on the question Diane asked, which I was going to ask, which is her, uh, this uh, Lorelei's question. Once the town issues a final certificate, who is responsible for any problems that may occur or have not been resolved? And you said we can't keep Rick on for a little while longer or whatever. So then who would be? Is that all coming to you? Once the project is finished right. and Arlington 360 is fully operational. Brightview is fully operational. I, I guess I could work, or other town departments could work to settle a neighborly dispute, but as long as they are within the law, within the, the permits that were issued, mm -hmm. there's little that can be done. Okay. So it would be if it's a CONCOM issue, if it's, a, if it's ARB issue, it's if a it's a noise issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the same thing. Yeah, existing, by, existing bylaws need right. to be adhered to. And, and maybe there's nothing we can do. And, but, and okay. how soon do we think that final permit will be? How, how close uh, are we? Weeks, months? Month to two months. Month to two Maybe months. sooner. We're getting very close. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. yes. I just want to note that there's a couple of different layers 
to what's going on. It <coughs> depends on what issue a neighbor would seek to address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's the um, basically a certificate of completion by the ARB. Then there's the final certificate of occupancy, which is probably the most important thing yeah. in terms of retaining some sort of leverage in the situation if people are unhappy. But then there's also some other things, there's some bonds and other issues that are that exist for the purpose of addressing any issues that maybe seem like they're, satis they're, they're, they're satisfactorily addressed but maybe aren't. For example, like the um, environmental certifications about certain types of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of different things that address different types of issues that might have slightly different time frames outside of the certificate of occupancy. Thank you. Any other questions? In the executive session, do we have a? We should take a we move the vote on the correspondence receipt. Oh, okay. good. Thank you. But do we um, do we vote on? I move yeah. receipt. Oh, yeah, I think we second. move receipt, and we had a second, if not perfect. Yeah. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Um, motion. The second motion to the public. Refer to. You can do it all once. Okay. okay. Consider. Okay. I consider it all done. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Dan made the motion. Mm -hmm. Kevin seconded. Perfect. And the motion includes referring that piece of correspondence yes. to, to the public memorials. Yep. Okay. No executive session. So, do we have a motion to adjourn? New business. Oh, new business. I am jumping the gun. Marie. Can we skip new business. <laughs> I have nothing to report. Doug. Nothing to report. Adam. Nothing to report. Nothing. Um, I think Kevin did the remarks at the outset and pretty much encapsulated and captured everything, all the cap words. Um, in terms of the other candidates, uh, I do want to say I am very grateful not only to be returning to office, but honestly to be returning with these folks here um, when I was out on the campaign trail. Normally here, I'm just worried about me getting in, but when people pressed about, you know, what's your time like on the board, I have to say I'm enjoying the best times that I have. Um, in my tenure as a selectman, I think we're, we all meld well, um, and when we disagree, um, we do it respectfully, and um, when we walk out that door, we go back to the business of Arlington. So as equally thrilled as I am to get reelected to over 6,000 voters, I wish we'd gotten some more. Um, I really am happy to be back and, and working with you all, and I'm very excited about it. And that's it for new business. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. I'm afraid my list is longer, but it shouldn't be too long. Uh, first, I want to, I, I too, thank the voters. I'm, um, I'm really proud of the last three years, and I'm really excited to be able to do it another three years. And uh, I sat down over the weekend and I made a list of all the things that I have left. Like, and, and I've got a list, I seriously have 18 items and I'm like, and I keep adding to it of things like, oh yeah, I have to follow up with that. Oh yeah, I have to finish that thing. So there's a lot of stuff going to Adam's inbox, <laughs> among other things. <laughs> all right, um, item number two. Uh, went a couple weeks ago, there, um, uh, District Attorney Marion Hardy had a, uh, presentation over at the senior center, uh, uh, um, oh, excuse me, Marion Ryan, excuse me, uh, sorry, uh, had a presentation over at the senior center about elderly safety that I thought was really good and very interesting. And it was reminded of um, both some of the challenges that, you know, some of the elderly within town have, but also some of the resources that they have available. And I thought it was a really good presentation and well done. Uh, in the, uh, I was very happy to see Chief Fred Ryan there and some of his officers in the support they were giving our community there. Um, number two, also police related. I was delighted to see on Twitter, Arlington MAPD. No so He's you following you. <laughs> well, I say, well, I followed them first, so it was okay, but they are following me now. And uh, three hours ago, Arlington MAPD tweeted, Follow Arlington HHS for the latest on the town of Arlington's Department of Health and Human Services. So I know I'm jumping the gun because uh, Adam and his no, office no, no, haven't no, no, put no. that out yet, but nonetheless, I was really, you know, it's great. Uh, step forward, and I was really happy to see that. Uh, third item is uh, I got unsolicited uh, um, praise from someone who I would describe as one of Arlington town government's harsher critics about the budget message that the town manager put forward on the town website. And um, I, so before you went away for your long weekend, you put up the town budget message. And so I encourage everyone to go and check it out. It's a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a really powerful document and it really talks a lot about what we're doing. So um, it's a, also a good top lead in for town meeting, of course, which is coming up. But if you wanna educate yourself about what we're spending 
and why and all that, I mean, that document is, is really a, a great one. All done. Mr. Chair. Nothing, no new business. Are you sure? That was the only uh, one. I, 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 uh, I took my quota last time. <laughs> um, I, I'll be quick. I, I just want to thank my <coughs> colleagues um, for tonight's vote. I am honored to have you in this position, and I look forward to working with all of you over the next year. Um, that's one. Two, um, I, uh, this isn't very well marketed, or, but on Friday night, I went to the Kickstand Cafe, which is actually called Jam and Java, on the first Friday of every month. And they had a open mic that was phenomenal. Hmm. Um, so I highly. What? How did you do? I, I'm not one. I, I, I could have, have sung. Yeah. What? I didn't have the selectones with me. First Friday every month. First Friday, Kevin. Kevin. Wow. I, I don't get up on stage without the selectones. But um, one of my college roommates actually played, and uh, he, it was great. And I uh, um, highly crowd. recommend checking out. There was a good crowd. Um, it, great coffee. Um, it keeps you up. Keeps yeah, you up late, yeah. but it's a good excuse to maybe go to Monotomy or one of the other restaurants afterwards. Um, but that being said, I just wanted to give it a little shout out. Nice. And um, there we go. Move we adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> nope. Thank you.